is about finding out who you are and what makes you happy and becoming that within yourself so that you're not running around looking for somebody else to do it for you. You need to become the partner that you want to attract. Right? So we're going to talk about templates and checklists very, very shortly. But one of the things we have to do was we're going to, we're going to use, we're going to use their checklists and a lot of other neuro-linguistic and, and so, social psychological processes to create this phenomenon. But we need a way to measure it. We need to know what we want and how we know that we're getting it. Yes. So wouldn't you say a person would really need to love themselves, like themselves before they even go out and try to... Well, it depends on what you're looking for. Okay. One of the things in Soulmate Secrets, which is a course about, it's kind of like, it's on the spiritual romantic side of things because everybody, a lot of people, um, they keep meeting the same person with a different face. And the reason that happens is because they have templates and woundings from childhood, from previous partners, from their parents and their parents' parents that are, are actually driving what they find attractive, not because it's attractive, but because it's familiar. And this is one of the things that we need to really understand if we want to start to, to generate attraction. There are many different ways to generate attraction. One of the most common ones is what we call the familiarity principle. How many times have you read a story about some rich Orange County person or sleeping with the milkman or the pool person, right? And maybe they're not even that cute, right? But they keep, but they see them every single day. And what's, what's been shown is that frequency increases attractivity. The more somebody, even if they don't, if on a scale of one to 10, you're a solid five or six. If you show up every day for six months, it's going to climb up to a seven. It's going to climb up to an eight. It's Again, it's the long term, but these are things that hack the nervous system, this whole frequency idea. Now, do we want to wait six months? Well, I don't know. But the idea is the more things become familiar, the more attractive they become. And that's the bugaboo when we're dealing with the human nervous system. The templates that are driving our romantic bus have been with us since the time we came out of the womb. Your human nervous system sorts for what's familiar, what was there first, okay? Your values are going to evolve from that, but there will always be this gravity towards what you grew up with or what was familiar growing up. Soulmate Secrets is about, okay, this is what I want, this is what I'm getting, how do I make that transition? What changes inside of me do I, I need to make to become that person? And what are the qualities in my partner and how will I know that I'm getting it? And that brings us to something called the checklist. Okay, you see at the center of this diagram, let me just go through this real quick. So we, we talked about knowing your outcome, knowing what you want. Now, I have about 35 personal injury attorney clients who use the exact same stuff I'm teaching you to depose witnesses, to win, to do jury selection, to do negotiation and mediation. I literally have seen on video expert witnesses for my clients' opponents voluntarily trying to waive their attorney client privilege to answer my client, my students' questions because of these technologies. There's nothing here that's theoretical. The good news is it's 100% ethical, but it's only as ethical as the person using it. There's, there, if you use the system the way it's taught, you never need to lie, cheat, steal, misrepresent, or confabulate in any way. Now, there are systems out there where, where truth is kind of a nice idea, right? But those are mostly for military and espionage applications, okay, right? This can be used for that, but it wasn't designed that way. It was designed to be on the on the right side of, of ethics and honesty and integrity. That being said, it does make use of some extremely powerful neurological processes and psycho, psychosocial processes. So I want you to understand is that it's fun and it's free, and I want you to take this out and use it. Some of this stuff you're gonna you're gonna hear me say it, and you're gonna go, you're full of shit. Best part is you don't have to believe anything I'm telling you. Just use it. Right. And you'll find that all of your relationships will change, even ones you've had for years. OK, so the first thing is know your outcome, know what you want, know how you're getting it. The next is control your state. Now, this is 
uh, my, my good friend here is a, a Qigong person. And one of the things that we talk about in the Qigong world is you have these three bodies, right? You have your, your soul, your eternal soul, then you have your physical body, right? And you have your energy body, then you have your spirit body. Your, physiolo your physiology controls your psychology. So anything that changes what happens in your body changes what happens in your mind, which takes it from the physical form to the energy form to the, to the spiritual form. That's where they all meet, right? You said that so fast. You didn't even hear that thing again. Which part? Your, your, your psychology. Okay. Your physiology controls your psychology, right? I've been saying this for decades. Yeah. So uh, it is. And, and one of the things that we're going to talk about is we want to make people, we want to move through the world making everyone we meet feel ridiculously good about us. Okay. Now here's the, co the corollary to physiology controls the psychology. The fastest way to change anybody's body feelings is to change yours first. Fastest, most reliable way to change your feelings is by changing your posture and your breathing. Come on in. Don't be bashful. Right. You look familiar. Have you been to my meetups before? Yes, I remember. You have um, one topic in particular. I think Jamie has the last question. This is for you. All right. Um, what's your name again? Cynthia, welcome. Um, let me go back to menu for today. Um, and I love questions, so don't be bashful. Uh, if I, but I will warn you, the more questions I get asked, the more rabbit holes I tend to go down. So, um, Cindy, what do you want to learn today? What do you want to take away from today's class? A new man. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Sorry, I had a had an old cartoon moment. All right. did, did nothing in particular, or just mm -hmm. okay. All right. So this is if if we could sum what we're doing up in terms of uh, NLP speak, this would be rapid fire, deep level rapport. Right. And here's the thing you understand about rapport, whether we're talking about energetics, whether we're talking about romance, whether we're talking about negotiation, mediation, networking, therapy, the deeper the rapport, the more things are possible. Energetically, if I want to influence your, your whole system, the more I can get energetically in rapport with you, the more influence I have over that system, because the system stops thinking of me as something different or separate. And that's where really cool things can happen. So. Physiology controls the psychology. We want to move through the world making people feel ridiculously good. The fastest way to change a person's body feelings is to change yours first. So let's play with that first. And uh, there's a there's a fun drill that I'm going to I'm going to give you guys. Um, when we go out to interact with people, we've got to get our state right. So that's what this little model is about. Controlling your state. When I, from, let me give you a little bit of a background about where a lot of this material, or where I got started. I don't really hide the fact that a lot of the things I learned um, were, were came from the dating and seduction fields of the early 2000s and things of that nature because I never wanted to be a therapist. Um, when, I, when I was first learning about these kinds of things, there were only three things I wanted in life. I wanted to get chicks, kick butt, and be cool. And because I didn't have the answer to any of those problems, questions, I became pretty fanatical about finding ways to solve my problems. And that's why I'm sitting here today is because I had to sift through a lot of crap, sit through a lot of seminars, read a lot of books, and then test a whole lot of stuff to figure out what actually works. And I don't feel like I have to take a shower after using it. Because there are some things that I studied that I've studied with both very famous teachers and very infamous teachers. And, and one of the things that happens is people leave an imprint, a psychic imprint, for lack of a better word, on the techniques and the systems that they that they create. So one of the things that became very, very obvious is that people need to get their feel, their body feelings under control before they engage with people. Now, how do we do that? 
posture and breathing. How many people here have ever heard of a, a woman by the name of Amy Cuddy? Okay, your first homework assignment is to go to go to YouTube, the TED Talks, find Power Poses by Amy Cuddy. It's an amazing talk. Uh, Professor Cuddy is an amazing researcher, uh, and she's actually done the scientific validation of the things I'm going to share with you. Now, in my corner, I was teaching that stuff back in the early 2000s. Her, her material came out around 2010, 2012, but she's done the hard science. So here's what it is. If you take any particular physiology, assuming you know what that physiology is, or what it unlocks, and you hold it for at least two minutes, the hormonal balance and your psycho-emotional states will change to the point where you can actually calibrate it through a blood test. Like if, if I take a, a basic victory pose, when, when, when people, even blind children, when they, when they win, they go, it's just hardwired into us, right? If I take this pose and I hold it, for as little as two minutes, it's gonna cause a chain reaction in my system that changes my hormonal balance, it changes my body feelings, and because of that, it's gonna activate something in your body known as a reticular activating system. Sure. Yeah, okay. The reticular activating system, or RAS for short, is a part of your neurology that controls what you pay attention to and the meanings you assign to it. So if I go into a room and I'm feeling great, I'm feeling victorious, I'm feeling powerful. If there are eight things in that room that are negative and two things in that room that are positive, because I enter that room in a positive, triumphant, victorious state, guess what I'm going to psychologically and, and attentionally orient on first? The positives. So if I can tap into that state, everything about my consciousness changes. Now, this, how does this apply to dating? Most people, and when we're talking about dating or, or, or approaching for that, and we'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of that, both both genders want to be approached, but they have different hangups and different fears about the approach. Men are terrified of getting rejected, right? When they see an attractive woman, they're like, you can, you can, you can feel them psyching themselves up. I'm the greatest lover in the world. 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 And then they go to make the approach like, hmm. she's not interested anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Takes you by surprise, throws you off it's outside your map, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. That you're old school, right? But we'll fix that. So now why, why, why does it become that way? It's because even though the guy's in the corner consciously trying to build up his energy, the reason he has to build up that energy in the first is because he's been running shitty movies for the past 20 minutes before that of all the times he got rejected, made fun of, emasculated, right? All the things that he's running, he's screwing up. He's running movies that's changing his body feelings, which changes posture. And now he's running on pure willpower. And then it gets within proximity. Beautiful women have a tendency to knock us off our game anyway. You just automatically throw us into less than resourceful states unless, you just, unless you've been doing it a long time. Now, women want to be approached, but they've been sold a bill of goods too. You see, there's in certain, and again, this may be different with some of the younger generations. So please, for everything I give you, you can find an exception. We're not here to talk about exceptions. We're here to talk about generalized templates that we can apply, overlearn, and then we have the bandwidth to focus on the things that are different. Women, two gaps in their socialization. One is they're taught many times to use body language that doesn't signal to the person that they're attracted to that they're attracted to them. Uh, maybe, maybe you remember, maybe you were taught this, maybe you weren't. Were you taught, and I don't know, I'm just asking, that if you're attracted to a guy or a girl, don't make eye contact with them. Yeah. 
Okay, but I bet you don't have. To, but I bet you don't have. Pro, I bet you don't have trouble making contact with a guy you're not attracted to. Boom! There's the first one. You got to flip the script on that. Okay, if there's somebody you're not attracted to, don't make eye contact. The studies are there. The longer you have eye contact with someone, the more attractive they become. I'll, I'll pull up a book on Amazon, but they've done studies at different universities with eye. They're back in the like '90s and early 2000s. They would literally have eye gazing parties where people get together and they would just stare into each other's eyes for like an hour. It's kind of creepy if you ask me, but but these are the things that we need to understand. So the first thing when it comes to approach and, and attractability is you make eye contact with the people you are attracted to and avoid eye contact with the people you're not. But we're not taught that. And so the default many times creates the inverse of what we're going for, right? Many women also, when it comes to being approached, they, they, they get nervous about the approach, not because they don't want you to approach, but because they're afraid of the, that you won't leave. <laughs> because what happens is a lot of times guys are so focused on, on, on trying to get with somebody, the woman's sending off all kinds of subtle cues, go away, this not detour this way, not, not interested, right? Now, every woman in the place watching that interaction knows she's not having it. But every guy in the place is going, oh, he's doing so good. <laughs> Why? Because you have different sorting mechanisms. Women, as a byproduct of their evolution, have developed this amazingly powerful social radar. Right? You can uh, you can have a single guy standing in a group of women talking, and at some unbeknownst moment, every woman in the group knows the conversation is over, and they're gone. And our hapless hero is like, shit, I'm alone. How did that happen? Right? So one of the things that we as men have to do is we have to train to get up to what women are, what women are aware of naturally. Now, because of the, the degree of subtlety in their perceptual rate, I'm not here to be pro-women or anti-men or, or anti-men and pro-women. We need to understand the, the, the differences about and the way the world is so that we can make it what we want it to be. One of the other big problems is there's a gap in many women's socialization. And I think it's probably gotten worse now after the hashtag Me Too movements and everything else. Men are so worried about stepping on a landmine that they won't approach at all. So what happens is the people who wind up making approaches are the jerks and the sociopaths, the people who don't care about your boundaries, which again is, is not your fault. You've been sold a bill of goods in terms of positive social skills and positive body language body language of attraction. You see, the, the challenge is that because of the kind of body language, and, and I, should, I should put this caveat out there, the body language of shyness mirrors the body language of aloofness, which is equivalent to being a snob. And because human beings have an inherent negativity bias, in other words, if one good thing happens, my nervous system assigns a gravity of one. If a, one bad thing happens, my nervous system assigns a gravity of four. Power of Bad by Roy Baumeister. Go check it out. I'm going to give you a very long reading list. Now, why is that important to dating or flirting or whatever? A, because of the inherent negativity bias of the human nervous system, if somebody's in a bad mood, they automatically see you through that filter. It's just something you're going to have to be aware of so you know how to manage it. Right? So we're going to talk about something very shortly called positive eye contact, certain body language cues that as you're moving through the world, you can sort for or initiate that lets you know where a person's at in terms of willingness to interact, right? So we'll put a pin in that for right now. But one of the things that women have to learn how to do is, so a lot of times if they don't make eye contact or the person comes up and you just blow smoke in their face or something like that, they, they go away. But sometimes when they're in an interaction, about halfway through that interaction, woman realizes this this isn't happening. This is not a relate you know, an interaction, but she doesn't know how to get out of it. Why? Because more often than not, she's given all the subtle cues 
that every woman in the place would pick up on. But our, our hapless hero, who doesn't have the same social sensitivity, doesn't perceive them. If he knew she didn't want to talk, he would leave. But he doesn't perceive it, so he thinks he's doing okay because he hasn't been kicked in the nuts yet, metaphorically or literally speaking. So at the beginning, we know women know how to handle that interaction. Then a lot of women, when they get to the midway through the interaction, when they realize it's not going to go anywhere, there's a, a piece missing from their extraction process. They don't know how to extricate themselves from the interaction without lapsing into bitch mode. Or with by pres or preserving the guy's self. You've ever had it. You're talking to a woman. You think you're doing. All of a sudden, she just becomes the ice queen, right? Why? Because you missed all the subtle cues that she was sending out. She didn't have anything left in the in in the gun except bitch mode. It wasn't your fault, except it was because you didn't pick it up, ladies. It wasn't your fault because you're both moving through the world. Remember, I talked about checklists. Each of you has a checklist that determines how you know what you're getting is good or not good. How many have ever heard of the psychological phenomenon known as projection? Okay. Projection says if I'm angry or, or somebody hurts somebody, me, I'm gonna I'm gonna project it onto you and make you the, the the perpetrator. Each and every one of you is moving through the world with a little checklist. And you're projecting that out into the world. And you're making the assumption that everyone you meet has the exact same checklist. And when they're che when the things they do, because they're we're all operating from our own checklists. When the things they do from their checklist don't match the things from your checklist, you either don't recognize it or it pisses you off because you interpret it differently. Right? So we need to learn how to elicit and understand other people's checklists. Now, there's some very simple ways to do that, but you need to understand that if you're going to start playing in this in this in these waters, the onus to change, to do something different, has to be on you. You've got to do something different to get a different result. Because and it takes energy to do that. So let's play a little bit. Everybody stand up. Um where did where did Moss go? What are you doing out there? Okay, well, I need you monitoring the, the Zoom room, please. All right, so I want you to close your eyes. Think of a time in your life when you were having the best time ever, best play time ever. I don't care what it was. I don't care who you were with, how many rules you're breaking, what, whether you passed curfew or not. I don't care. I want you to remember the fun you were having. I want you to remember how you were standing in that moment. I want you to remember how you were breathing in that moment. I want you to see what you were seeing, hear what you were hearing, smell and taste what you were smelling and tasting. Let those feelings come flooding back. I want you to really remember the way, if you were standing, stand the way you were standing in that moment. Breathe the way you were, yes, exactly. Breathe the way you were breathing. Now, without changing a single thing about the way you're standing, without changing a single thing about the way you're breathing. As an act of will, try to feel bad. It's a lot. Of, you you got to actually work hard to do it. It's hard, right? Because your physiology is stronger than your psychology. So the first thing we want to do, you can stop playing now. You have a seat. Now, this works the other way, too. In, in, in a lot of our classes, what I'll do is I'll have you go into the positive side and then try to feel bad. And then what a lot of times I'll have you do is I'll have you go back to a less than positive time, go into that body language, and then try to summon up your willpower and try to feel good. For the sake of time, most people can't do it. But the simple fact is, if you want people to feel good around you, the fast you have to change their body feelings. The fastest way to change another person's body feelings is to change yours first. Okay. Now, in my other classes, like Hidden Laws of Attraction, Manifestation, things of that nature, this becomes even more important because the vibrational frequency that you're sending out to the universe is the sum total of your body feelings. And so if I can change your body feelings, I change your vibrational signature, and I change what the universe draws to me. 
social interaction, it's also true. If there's somebody I want to approach, I can approach them in a nervous state, a playful state, a curious state. Oh, she's going to reject me state or he's going to reject me state. Which one do you want to be in? So the first thing that has to happen is you have to control your emotional state. That state for most applications, negotiation, dating, voir dire, um, is actually playful. The more playful you can be, the more powerful you become. Because when you're playful, when you're relaxed and easygoing, when you're just looking for the fun, it neutralizes and fly, it slips under people's defense mechanisms. When a man approaches a woman in most social interactions, some level of nervousness tends to come up, either because she feels the sexual vibe or, or, or possibility of one, or there's a big, strong human coming at them that they're probably not physically um, capable of handling. There's exceptions to every rule. These are the things that, that again, are just part of the everyday life of, of a human being of either gender. So we need to understand these things and find ways to buffer them. Okay. So one of the things we want to do is we want to start practicing positive, happy states. We want to find the fun in everything we do. How many of you would like to be up to 31% better at everything? Okay. Here's all you got to do. Be playful. Now, that particular statistic comes from a guy named Chris Foss. How many people here know who Chris Foss is or was? Chris Foss was the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI. And Voss says when the hostage negotiator approached the bad guy, the hostage taker, with a playful, relaxed, easygoing attitude, he was up to 31% more aware, flexible, adaptable, smarter, and his counterpart, the hostage taker, was up to 31% more compliant. What if you could up, up your hit rate by 31%? Would that change things for you? That's level one, right? Now, when you do that, your, your proprioceptive neurology, your mirror neurons are going to interact with the mirror neurons of everyone around you. That's going to cause a chain reaction in them. They most, you ever hear this, the expression emotions are contagious? Okay. If you can generate a strong enough emotional state and, and embody it, it will actually infect everyone around them, around you. And then you will start, they will start to feel that way and they'll think it was their idea. But who are they looking at when those feelings hit? They're looking at you. Guess who gets linked to those feelings? And here's the thing. It's completely ethical, and you can't get caught. When someone's going, oh, you're, you're just making me feel good, right? I see what you're doing. You're, having, you're feeling good, so I'll feel good. Yes, <laughs> right? So again, now, obviously, from a qualitative perspective, this is important. From a strategic perspective, we want people to think and feel good right so we have to think and feel good about us does that make sense okay let me just check in with my zoomers really quick uh questions from the from our folks at home so we have i think there we go no avoid feedback so questions from zoom um Someone wants a deeper dive into three magic questions. Mm -hmm. We have obviously a, not a new person to Planet Davis. Indeed. But it is on the to-do list. Someone actually called in about that here today. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, we're going there for sure. Another person, I am in a relationship. I am a relationship coach and and I am an relationship coach and love to be able to help my clients to become more free in their dating game. Okay. Uh, another person, how long to flirt before walking away? We have another learn to mask echo technique perfectly. So I want to ask why I summarize what they're saying. Another person, how to stay flirty to keep my marriage interesting. Okay. 
uh, the same person with the relationship coach, uh, learning to make people feel good for no reason. I love that. And then we have another individual. Hi, David. Is it okay for a girl to know your truth? Don't, don't overwhelm me with questions. <laughs> <laughs> Moss tends to just drone on and on until you're finally looking at I'm going, I love you, Moss. Make it stop. Make it stop. Uh, you had a question. Yes. In fact, if you go to uh, heartmath.org, they used to have a free ebook that you could download. If they still offer it, go to chapter six. They literally strapped up a dog and his boy and sent him out in the yard to the plane. Within 15 minutes, their heartbeat synchronized. They did the same thing with horses. So this is this is not something that is just a suggestion thing. Trust me, I know a lot about suggestion. But there's a lot of parts of us that are constantly taking in information that are driving our bus. They're, 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 they're steering our, our perceptions, right? So I want to start, I want you guys in your personal practice to start working on ways to get in and out of certain emotional states and be able to trigger those on demand at well. Now, in, in our CPI classes, our killer influence classes, our vibrational influence classes, we devote a whole day to that where you're literally sending emotions back and forth, making people sway. And that's, that's this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's go ahead and get on microphone so the people at home can hear us. Uh, is this thing on? There we go. Um, so I tend to have a positive effect on other people, but being an empath, mm -hmm. I tend to also get overwhelmed with yes. other people. And so I was just wondering if you're going to talk about how do you also disconnect so that you're not like, okay. So out. when you're, I'll just give you a real quick one. When you are interacting with somebody and you get their feelings, where do you feel it? Usually down here. Okay. Okay. So what happens in a lot of times with people who are highly empathic is these centers are very open. So what you want to do is imagine pulling in all of that energy, moving it down into just below your belly button inside of you. What happens is when you pull that energy down, though it's like turning the dimmer switch down on that awareness. Okay. The other thing you can do when you start to sense other people's feelings and emotions is ask yourself a very simple question. Is this mine? Just the act of asking the question creates a separation, which allows you to let it be theirs. Because if you don't ask that question, whatever you sense becomes yours. Right? So in the medical Qigong that I study, when we're, when we're dipping into people's bodies, right, we'll, a lot of times we'll trigger an emotion. right, And the moment I feel it, I got to go and breathe it out or grab it and pull it out. Because if, if I say, oh, that, I'm, I'm feeling X, now it's mine. If your body just accepts it. So there's different ways to handle that. But as you're dipping in and you're feeling, again, this is not the medical Qigong or Qigong workshop. I do those. But that's, again, when you when you say, I'm feeling this way, or that's, why do I feel this way? It actually kind of make you make it kind of yours. So the first thing you can do is ask, is this mine? Another question you can ask, and this is one of the, the, the amazing things about your nervous system, is that you, the quality of your life experience changes by the quality of the questions that you ask. So when you feel a sensation in your body, aside from the question, is this mine or somebody else's, what else could this be? So if I get a feeling that I, I, I interpret as fear or anxiety, first thing I want to do when I become aware of that feeling is what else could this be? Just the act of acting, asking that question separates the label from the sensation and gives you the opportunity to label it something else, which your nervous system will now attach different meanings to, and you'll access a different set of memories. Now, if you want to get this, the neuroscience behind that, how emotions are made by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, it's the theory of constructed emotions, okay? Like I said, there's, there's redonkulous amounts of, of neuroscience, behind, but you don't need to know all that to do it. All you really need to do is know what you want, know how you're going to measure it, which we're going to get into very shortly, Get in the right psycho-emotional state by using your physiology and your breathing first. And that was the whole purpose of that first drill. I didn't forget you, Zoomers. Just bear with me. Okay? 
when I'm going to approach someone or when I'm going to get into an interaction, if I'm going in there serious, nervous, afraid, that's what they're going to pick up. Right. If you have, if, if you can't quite get it all under control, the next best thing you can do Ask me what I do for a living. Oh, yeah. Ask me what I do for a living. What do you do for a living? I'm an ass model. You might have seen my ass on a bunch of different covers. <laughs> now, is it, it's obvious I'm, 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 I'm bullshitting it, right? But I'm doing it in a fun and playful way, right? That's cocky funny. Or if, if, she were to, if, if I made a joke and she touched me, just, hey, this ain't free. I'm not a sausage with feet, 50 bucks. Right. That's cocky, funny. That's like teasing your bratty kid sister. Right. Very, very disarming. Think moonlighting. Have you ever watched the show moonlighting or, or any, you ever watch that, that snarky one upmanship dynamic that's catnip in relationships. The reason I bring that up is because if you're going to flirt, this is kind of the energy that is helpful to have. The problem is if you don't have playfulness down, you're not cocky, funny, you're all cock and no fun. Right. And, and that, and that was, that was the problem that my friend Joseph had is he would go up and he would approach these people, but he was so nervous and he was so stressed. He would deliver these teasing lines and they would get blatantly offended. Why? Because he had the technique, right? But he didn't have the state, right? And if you want to make approaches, if you want this to really work, it's got to come from the body first. You've got to get your body state right. If your body state is right, 93% of everything you need to do happens automatically. Literally, if my body feelings are right, my posture is right, my breathing is right, my gestures are right, my tonality is right, my eye contact is right, I could get all the words wrong and still be redonkulously attractive. Why? It's because all the other things are handled automatically. But when people are trying to learn these things, they learn them backwards. They're looking for the magic words, the magic clothes, the magic body language, right? And they're, so they're managing it from, you guys know how your brain is layered, right? You have what we call the neocortex. That's the new layer of the brain. 
And then you have what we call the limbic system, which is kind of like the mammalian emotional brain. And then you have right in the center, right at the base of the brainstem is the reptilian brain. Attraction works from the brainstem up, but most people try to do it from the neocortex down. And so everything is out of whack. You're incongruent. Your words don't match your gestures. Your gestures don't match your posture. Your eye contact doesn't match anything, right? Because when, when, you, when you're in the throes of attraction, this is what happens to eye contact. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> if, if you can do that, sometimes, hey, I, what are you doing? Right? Because you, you're terrified of making eye contact. So it's like, I excuse me. Yeah. From. Yeah. You just, again, <laughs> we're going to, I mean, I'm, 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 a, I'm pretty up on body language, but we're going to talk about big pieces today because if you can't get the big stuff, you're, you're going to completely miss the little things. Yes, sir. That's another thing is there's this thing in the, in, in the, in the, in the pickup world called one-itis. And what happens is you attach all of your self-worth and all of your entire dating future to the opinion of one person. If this person approves me, then I will be worthy and everyone will love me and they'll know that I'm worthy. Right? We, it, 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 it doesn't make sense, but this is how we work unless we're trained and, and we're educated differently. Okay? So... Know what you want, control your state. Now, like I said, we have whole trainings devoted to that, but the first thing I want you to understand and, and write this down is your physiology controls your psychology. If you want to change your emotional state, start with the body because the body is the most bulletproof way to, to get and maintain a state. Yes, Cynthia? It seems to make sense, but it seems tricky because then you have Oh, there's, you have, the ladies have all the microphones. <laughs> Seems tricky. It seems like it involves a lot of training around your nervous system, right? Because you have to be able to. It involves practice. Being a regulated. Mm -hmm. right? Well, here's the thing. Okay. Knowing what states to embody is the first step. Having a process to make that your norm is the next step. What's nice is that your nervous system isn't stupid. It's just slow to change because it sorts for what's familiar. If you would get up, and again, we teach our, our students this. Again, I, I'm, I'm sorry to tease you guys with all these things. I'm trying to give you things that you can use without, I guess I could spend an entire day and a half on just the state control stuff. But if you would practice your power poses five, six times a day, two minutes, that's 12 minutes a day. Each each segment, my, my calibration, and this is just my anecdotal report, each, each phase lasts about 20 minutes. So if the more you practice these, these positive physiologies, the more you make them habitual, the more that will become your default state. Okay. Now we also have, and you're an actress, so um, you've probably been to acting classes where they've practiced, had you practice going into certain emotions as deep as you can and then coming out and going into other emotions. We actually teach you to do that because actors are the most natural hypnotists on the planet. You want to be a great hypnotist. You want to be a great uh, communicator. Take an acting class. Right, because their whole craft is designed to do what me therapeutically I do, is to reach into somebody's world and suck them into mine. Right, and so the more you can bring those things out and engage people's neurologies, the more compelling and charismatic they're going to find you. And that's really where charisma starts: is this ability to generate feelings and direct emotions to people and have them experience those. Right, that starts from the physiology, the posture, the breathing, the eye contact. Right. If I'm in a fun, playful state, it's going to ripple out and people will feel more relaxed and playful around you. Right. It seems very simple and it is, but it's not always easy because we've got other shit happening all the time. If you want this ability and it is a superpower, believe me, if there was a Jedi skill at Planet David and we got some really cool stuff, not the pop ups, mind you, but. Um, it's the state control. In fact, it's the one thing we don't actually release on YouTube because it's that powerful. So posture and breathing. I recommend four basic states. First one is relentless. Second one is playful, curiosity, and triumph. These are four states that have a specific physiology. Now, yours will be slightly different. If you practice them 12 minutes a day or more, 
A, you're going to feel a lot better. Okay, you're going to get healthier. It's going to start to become a habit. And so the moment you begin to interact with somebody, you're going to see somebody that you want to interact with. You're going to decide what you want. You're going to hit the posture. You're going to make the approach, right? When I'm teaching people how to do networking or um, work in clubs and things of that nature, first thing I'm going to teach them are specific body language meta frames. So we have four that we teach. I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to give you guys one. Maybe two. Okay. The first one is called the rock star meta frame. Okay. So this particular process actually comes from a book on hypnotic seduction written for women to use on men. Okay. The book is called Love Trances by Craig Ravinsky. I highly recommend that book. Love Trances by Craig Ravinsky. In that book, Craig talks about a client he was working with who on the, the attractiveness scale was a solid six, but all her friends were like nines and tens and they would go out together and they would go to clubs. And every time they'd walk into a club, she'd walk in with her friends and everybody in the place would swarm her. And all of her nine and 10 lingerie model friends are going, what? <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, you know you, Craig was doing an interview with her and he's basically asking, well, so you're obviously not just putting out what, what's, what's, what's going on here. What's got all these, these people flocking to you to, 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 to meet you and, and ignoring your friends. He said, that's easy. Before I go in, I just imagine I'm the most famous pop star in the world. That's my party and everybody's there to see me. So she would literally spend five, six, however long it took her to get into that state, to step into that character. The moment she got her physiology and her breathing and her identity right, everything else cascaded from there. It rippled out. And so when she walked in, she walked in like she owned the place. Feel the difference in my energy? How long did that take? You just got to practice. We've all done this as little kids. Pretend we were a rock star, right? That's all you got to do. It's as simple as playing pretend. But it's not fake it till you make it. It's embody it so that you radiate and emanate it. Does that make sense? Now, what's going to happen when you get out in the real world is that people are going to try to control what identity you hold on to. It's called a framework, right? So there will like I'll get yeah, I'll give you one of my my little stories here. Back in the day when I was really experimenting with this, uh, I had just moved to California, and um, I had I was in acupuncture school, so I was getting ready to do clinic. I had gotten involved with a group that plays with the SCA called the Clan Dark Sale. They were a, a pirate reenactment group, and so I was in the process of learning about pickup and attraction and dating. I was studying NLP and all these other forms of, of social influence. And I was trying to develop this character that I was going to play in the SCA. And so all these things are gelling and, and, and merging around in my head. And right about that time, Pirates of the Caribbean came out. And so I was like, and then I, I was like, I was looking at Captain Jack Sparrow. And the moment I heard the voice, I knew I had found the missing piece, right? Now, most of you know, or maybe you don't know, but the character of Captain Jack Sparrow that Depp created was actually modeled off Keith Richards, right? That's why he played Jack's dad in the, in the, in the, in the sequels. Everything that, that Sparrow, that became Jack Sparrow was modeled off of Keith. He's a rock star because, and, and, and Depp's thinking was, Pirates were the rock stars of the seven seas, right? And so everything he did was about this, right? And so I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm exploring socially programmed anchors. I'm exploring characterization. I'm exploring frame control. What if I just started going around talking like this all the time? So I did for about three months, maybe longer, actually longer, but... You gotta remember, I, I just started going to clinic. So I was going to the clinic first couple of weeks as David. After that, I was I was still David, but I was a little different. 
And so people would come up to me who knew me and go, why are you talking different? I go, what are you talking about? Right? And they're like, why, why are you changing your voice? And I say, why are you changing your hair? Why can't you be somebody? Why can't you be original? Why, why can't you? Why are you really? Right? And every female in the place you sound just like Johnny Depp. No, he sounds just like me. <laughs> That's an amazing accent. Where are you from? Oklahoma. <laughs> right? And for the first couple of weeks, everybody challenged me to go back to the old me. That's a framework. Everyone you know, everyone you meet is trying to put you in a little box. That box is based on their checklist. The person who controls the frame controls the game. Now, is it really a game? It works a lot better if you treat it like one. Because then if you lose or, or it doesn't work out, you just play another game. Right? When we're playing our video games and we get killed or... Do we sit there and crawl into a bag of Hagen dazs You know, I lost my video game. <laughs> right? But when we get rejected, we sure as hell do, don't we? The reason we call it the game is because if you treat it like a game, it doesn't hurt. You don't take it as seriously, which is the first thing you have to do if you want to be attractive. If you're not bringing the fun because you're too damn serious, you'll never get to the long-term stuff. How many people have ever just heard of this thing called online dating? Okay, here's the first thing I want you to understand. They're lying to you. <laughs> now, I know you think you know what I'm talking about. But if you go to somebody's dating profile, I don't care if they're a man or a woman. And by the way, I should probably give you my disclaimer. If politically incorrect language, colorful metaphors, swearing, or the word boobies offends you, probably not the best use of your night. My intention is never to offend anyone, but I do tend to provoke people. And if I do provoke, provoke you, it's your problem, not mine. But no, no. <laughs> let me explain that. Let me explain that. We don't know we have a problem until somebody provokes it. But because of projection, we blame the person that did the provoking instead of looking at who it was really about. More often than not, when people lose their shit on you, it's actually not about you. It's about somebody you remind them of that you just happen to trigger, right? I spent about 16, 15, 16 years in the clinic dealing with that, right? So you got to bring, here's the thing. If you go to a person's dating profile and you say, I want a partner who is obedient, loyal, thrifty, brave, clean, courteous, kind, cheerful, right? Send them to the Boy Scouts of America page because that's basically what they're looking for, right? Drinks red wine and must love dogs, right? So you say, I love dogs. I drink red wine. I was a Boy Scout. Click, ghost, right? Okay, assuming you have a decent face, right? And I don't know what decent is, but let's just put the, put the attraction part aside. But you check all the boxes profile. And then you actually get to meet them and nothing happens. But I don't understand. I checked all the boxes. No, you didn't because you didn't check the box that they didn't write. None of those things matter until they're having fun with you. Cindy Lauper said it best. Girls just want to have. If you're not bringing the fun, it doesn't matter about the other things unless they're very transactional. If you don't enjoy, if you don't enjoy spending time with somebody, you'll never find out how loyal they are. You won't stick around. You'll never find out how much you know, intelligent they are many times. Why? Because it, it's, it's like going to the dentist. Needs to be done, but it, you know that's why we all hate dating. Does that make sense? So we got to focus on the fun factor. We got to focus on being playful, not taking these things so seriously, not, not betting our whole life on the outcome of one interaction. That's why I say go through the world and practice this stuff on people who don't matter. Now, I don't mean that, I don't say that to be mean or vindictive or, or transactional it's you need to practice these skills on average everyday humans that you don't really have a vested interest in getting something from 
because the more you do it and you see the effect of these skills, the more successes your neurology starts to log, the more comfortable you become with these processes so that when the time comes to deploy these skills in a situation that might matter a little bit more to you, you have the skill, right? So stay controlled. The next thing is get rapport. I'm going to teach you one of the most simple, powerful, most irresistible ways to get somebody's attention and keep it, and you won't believe it. You're going there right now. The most powerful words any human being can hear at any given moment are the words that just came out of their mouth. Literally, you're going to actually you're going to actually break up into groups and do this. Uh, what is called the echo technique. Now, I could give you all the different studies that have shown this, but we'll start with hostage negotiation. Uh, researcher by the name of Alexander Penland from Stanford University in his study on honest signals discovered that when people mimic each other, their compliance rate goes up by 30%. People who mimic their partners in speed dating and uh, job interviews got up to a 30 an average of a 30% pay increase. When somebody speaks... Every filter they have is connected to everything that comes out is connected to this checklist. Every gesture they make, every word they select, the more perfectly you can match the checklist, the more their nervous system literally can't not pay attention to you because your, 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 your nervous system is moving through the world, pinging everyone it interacts with to see how many boxes it can check. Okay. The more boxes that you check, the more focused on you they become, and the more they want to interact with you, the more they want to share and self-disclose. I'm teaching you the echo technique first, because if you like me, somebody who hates small talk, right, this is a lifesaver. If you want to find out if this person is a fit for you, this is a lifesaver. So people on Zoom are asking about three magic questions. We're going to go into that next. But if you don't have echo technique down, three magic questions are a little bit tougher. Okay. The most powerful words any human being can hear are the ones that just came out of their mouth. Okay. Now, when I teach the echo technique, I teach it in several layers. We're only going to do level one here, which is verbatim echoing. Okay, so when you get with a partner and you start having a conversation, I want you to listen to what they're saying. I want you to analyze. Well, I want you to memorize it verbatim. Right. And I want you to use as many of their words in your reply. As you can, as close to the order they came out as humanly possible. Now, here's what I don't care about. I don't care about how fast they talk. I don't care about what tonality they use. I don't care um, what words they emphasize yet. I want you to focus only on the actual words that they use. Okay. And I want you to watch the response you get from people when you do this process. Okay. One of the things you'll notice is that when people start to hear their own words come back, they go into a very, very powerful trance state because everything that just came back is a perfect key to lock fit to what they're looking for. When they hear their own words come back, they feel heard, paid attention to, understood, validated. And human beings are desperate for that level of connection. And once they have it, they will fight tooth and nail to keep it. So when you start going out into the world and playing with this, be respectful. Because if you go to some place like Denny's or restaurants or, or any place where a server can't escape you, right, and you start echoing their words, you will probably get better service than anyone in the place. You might even get a lot of free stuff. Don't believe me. Just go out and do it. But here's the thing. Because you press that button in your server, they'll ignore everybody else. So you might get them in trouble. Okay, This, this particular phenomenon has been validated in hostage negotiation. 
uh, therapy and uh, in social interactions by Penland, uh, D David Grove, and Chris Voss, three different places. The more times you use their language, the more attention you get, and the more they start hanging on your every word, and the more they talk. Now, here's the part I want you to understand. The longer they talk, the more attractive you become. Right? You've all experienced this first, the first date phenomenon. How many of you have been on a first date where you thought it went well and you never heard from them again? Right? Not, not you, you're a stud, right? But in, in, in many cases, you're, you're sitting across the table from someone. I'll use a male-female dynamic because I'm old school that way, right? And the guy's rattling on and on and on about how he went this vacation he took and how much money he makes because he's trying to make a good impression, right? And our, our, our hapless heroine is sitting there going, oh, that's nice. That's wonderful. In her mind, she's got a nice pick in her head going, waiting for her bailout call. When's my friend going to call? Ring, ring, one moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to go. My parrot keeps having an existential crisis. Right? Why? The guy's thinking, I was doing so great. I never heard from her again. Yeah, because you weren't doing the wrong all the fucking talking. Right? You got to flip that. You got to get them talking about the things they love, the things they're passionate about. When you use the echo technique properly, that will happen automatically. They'll just start running off at the mouth. Now, ladies, that's an amazing opportunity for you because the longer they talk, not only do they become more attracted to you, they start self-disclosing shit that you, you start checking your own boxes. Yes, no, hell no, hell no, bye, right? right? And that's where the next level of this comes in, the three magic questions protocol. The three magic questions protocol Starts with and if people want I, I can make a PDF of some of the things we're covering. Is this useful? You guys oh yeah. We it's not uncommon for people to up their closing rate by 40, 50 percent. Boom. Right? It's a universe, it's not it's not a sales thing, it's not a dating thing, it's a human thing. Here's the thing I you know, again, in this in Flirting and dating with romantic applications always brings out the weirdness in people. But I'm going to give you something very, I'm going to tell you something very, very true. The echo technique is the most ethical and honest way for any human being to communicate with any other human being. Why? Because it completely matches the way your nervous system is designed to want to be communicated with. Now, it's going to be weird for you to deploy the echo technique on somebody or with somebody else because to do what somebody else is doing means you can't do what you're used to doing. We call that the spotlight effect. Any, see, you, you're, you feel organic when you can just be yourself and communicate the way it's normal and natural for you. The problem is, is that when you communicate in a way that's normal and natural for you, it may not be normal and natural for the person you're actually trying to communicate with. So you need to step into their world, which means it's kind of like trying on somebody else's clothes. They may look good, but you know they ain't yours. And because you know they ain't yours, you think they know it. Because you're projecting. Untrue. I challenge you to try and get caught with this. You have to work really, really hard. But the best part is, if you adopt the attitude that I teach along with this echo technique, which is, this is the most ethical, desirable, validating way for one human being to communicate with another. We use the echo technique because it conveys that we understand them, because it actually does. In order to use the echo technique properly, you actually have to pay more attention to a human being than you normally would. But when you speak the words back, they feel like you got them. Because they feel like you got them, they want to give you more. Which means your value in their world goes up. And if they catch you, which happens from time to time, they'll say, why are you repeating everything I say? You just look at them and say, because I want, I want to really understand you and I want you to know that I understand you. Is that okay? Now, if they say no, you got other problems. But that's the truth. 
isn't it? Now you can only you can answer that for sure, but trust me or not, if you move through the world coming from that place, even when you get caught, there's nothing to catch. Does that make sense? You don't have to lie. It, the only time that things will go against you is if you get caught doing it and you stop. Remember I said that everybody around you is going to try and attack your frame? There's this old chestnut in classical NLP that if you're trying to use rapport skills on people and they catch you, it'll break rapport. Here's the hack to that. That only happens if you stop doing it. If you just keep going, eventually they'll just forget about it. But if you break, if they break your frame and you stop, you've just you've just validated their frame. You've lost the frame. So again, part of this job, part of this process is learning how to stay in character, stay in that mode. Right? That's why the, what I did in the clinic was so helpful for me. I mean, I, I had an acting background to begin with, but this was like trial by fire. I'm walking in with a patient talking like fucking Johnny Depp. Actually, not Johnny Depp, Captain Jack Sparrow, different character, right? Okay. Yeah, right. And I love it. If you go to you can go to my YouTube channel, you actually type in Captain Jack the Hypnotist. You'll see a video of me doing deep trance identification with somebody as Captain Jack. Yeah. Actually, the, the, the character I was using was Arik the Red International Man of Mystery, which was a hybrid. It was actually Captain Jack Sparrow, Wesley from The Princess Bride, Austin Powers, uh, a little bit of Tim Roth, uh, Tim Roth's character from Rob Roy and James Bond. That was, those were the pieces I, yeah. Classic romantic hero archetypes in a, in a specific proportion with an, an emphasis on the silly and the slapstick, right? That was the character I put together for my clan dark cell, but I took a small, a slightly less extravagant version, slightly less. I put on my white lab coat and I went into the clinic and I just don't like this. How are you today? Right. And it, it every, every female, and again, there's, that's my orientation. Every female in place, probably some of the men too, but I wasn't paying attention to them. Like, why? A, because Hollywood spent a redonkulous amount of money to put that avatar into the minds of every single person. If Hollywood puts it, spend all that money to put it there, why don't I just use it? Does that make sense? So this is, again, this is what I do in the power business. This is what I, you know, I geek out on this stuff, right? But my job is to make this easy. Control your body, control your breathing. When you approach somebody, hold the energy. Make sure it's a fun, playful, outgoing state. Now, let's talk, let's talk a little bit. Let's close the loop a little bit on your body language, and then we'll get into the echo technique, and then we'll do three magic questions. You guys having fun? Yeah. Yes, sir. Let me get these guys doing uh, doing their exercise, and then I will, I will actually I will have my whole undivided attention. Okay. So, yeah, body language. Body language is on a continuum. Okay. If I walk up to somebody like this, <laughs> right. First of all, I've got a massive graphite pole up my ass. Right. So I'm probably pretty reliable. You could probably guess that I'm. If I say something, I'm probably going to do it. But do I look fun? No, right? But when we talk about people who are honest, sincere, trustworthy, dependable, reliable, what word, what metaphors do we use? We say straight shooter, stand up guy, upright, upstanding. Everything about that language presupposes this orientation. How do we talk about people who are evil? Sly, okay, but think of it spatially. Bent, twisted, crooked. Sanctuary, sanctuary, right? So we have evil. Dudley do right. Is this guy exciting? Is this guy exciting? He's terrifying, right? But what about this? <laughs> Now, why are you laughing? You, you just suddenly, you suddenly felt playful, didn't you? You suddenly felt mischievous, right? So think about this from a body language perspective. You have the ends of the continuum, straight and upright, evil and twisted, but naughty but nice. 
right? Right? All right, going back to Pirates of the Caribbean, what was Captain Jack's favorite posture? Right? Am I symmetrical? No, I'm not like this. I'm like this. You don't open a sports a swimsuit uh, edition of Sports Illustrated or a Hustler or Playgirl and the models are like this. You see this. Why? Because asymmetry is flirtatious. It's mischievous. It's playful. It's naughty. If you want to step into that energy, get into the physiology. You see, your physiology controls your psychology. Again, physiology, psychology, body feelings, perceptual filters, emotional contagion. Now everyone in the place is feeling that energy. Why? Because you're embodying it from inside out. You're not telling them how to feel it. They're feeling it, and, inter and, and it's a feedback loop. And as long as you can maintain it, 93% of what you think do will be right. If you think of influence and persuasion as a 100-question test, but only 7% of it are the words you use. Only 7%. Which means if I got the body right, then the breathing is right, the gestures are right, the tonality is right, the volume is right, the eye contact is right, I can get all the words wrong and still get an A. Don't believe me. Play with it. Right? So when you're doing your echo technique, change your postures. Notice what happens when you kind of... You see, you're all laughing. I didn't tell you to laugh. Because it's hardwired into your neurology. People who, who have this, this feel good whenever you're around them, at some level, they're doing something like this. They may not be conscious of it, but it's there. It's happening. Does that make sense? So here's what you're going to do. You're going you're gonna to focus on the echo technique. Okay, but we're going to give you the first rudiments of the three magic questions protocol. Uh, let me find it really quick. MQ. Now, this, like I said, this original protocol was designed to for women to use on men. It was designed as a 20 minute framework that within 20 minutes, you would know everything you would need to know to know if these people were keepers or a hell no. Right now, I modified it so any gender could use it in any application it has three basic levels to this. Okay. So what does this do? It rapidly generates a pleasurable, stimulating conversation with ever-increasing levels of emotional attraction, trust, and bonding. That's going to happen automatically as a byproduct of going through the protocol. If you start adding the other bells and whistles, it's going to do something else, especially because we're focusing on the echo technique. What's going to happen is they're going to start self-disclosing. They're going to start volunteering. The, more that, the moment they hear their words coming back to them, they're going to volunteer more information. And if you're keeping your state under control, you're managing and measuring. Remember, the whole idea behind this particular protocol is ABT. Always be testing. As they talk, as you're moving through the levels of this interaction, are they checking your boxes or are you crossing them off? Because if they're not checking the boxes, that's not the right person. Now, this creates a very, very deep level of rapport very, very quickly. So you, as the person driving this, this particular interaction, have to be in control of your state. You have to be evaluating the quality of their answers versus your values, versus what you know checks your boxes. Now, again, in our trainings, we go really in depth into this stuff, but I can only paint broad strokes. Why? Because if you don't keep that mindset, you will become the victim of the attraction you generate. How many people here have ever dated somebody with potential? <laughs> right? You don't want to date people with potential. You want people who are actualizing their potential. Right? And if you've ever sat across from another person going, you know, with just the right person pushing the right buttons, they could be this and they could be this and they could be this and we could do this. You've just seduced yourself. You've literally just seduced yourself. Right? 
Why? Because that person's agenda may be completely different. Their, their desires may be completely different, but because you've already decided about your future together, your neurology wants to make it happen. So the idea when you, ABT is something I teach them all. Male or female, doesn't matter. Always be testing. Always be evaluating the information you're getting versus what makes you happy. And I don't care what the context is. Business, negotiation, jury selection, whatever it is. If they're not checking your boxes, that's not the right relationship for you. Chris Voss, I think, said it probably better than anybody. No deal is better than a bad deal. No relationship is better than a bad one. Okay. You came into this world alone, and regardless of who's around your bedside when you shuffle off this mortal coil, you're going out alone. So two things that's going to make your this so much easier for you. And again, they're not always going to be easy to wrap your head around. A seek to make your life as dramatically satisfying as humanly possible by yourself. Make your life the best video game you ever played and move through the world enjoying it. Because when you do, the partners you attract will be in harmony with that. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say. It's not as easy to do. Right? You know, and the other thing is, is that, um, well, that's enough. That's right. But again, because I got open loop because he loves to, he loves, to, I love interaction, by the way, but every now and then I get, I get sidetracked. No worries. No, it's, it's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's, we, you know, we're terrified of being alone because we feel incomplete inside. Right. No human being can complete you. It's a lie. It's a, it's a fallacy. Okay. But when you check all your own boxes and you move through the world, the people who are in harmony with that will notice and they will seek you out. You will go to places where people who have similar energies, similar vibrations hang out and things get easy, right? The more in common you have with somebody, the easier that relationship becomes. The more you have to work to be in a relationship with somebody, the more of a chore it becomes, right? Uh, Annie Lala, dating coach I respect a lot. I think it was her that said, if relationships that work tend to work from the start. Why? Because the boxes are all checked. This is how you start figuring that out in 20 minutes instead of 20 weeks of dating, crash diets, new wardrobes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The checklist. Mm -hmm. So would you say that if a person checks off like 80% of your checklist, like that's good? Because 100%, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. You have to decide what your good enough is. But here's the, here's the thing I tell my, my students in Soulmate Secrets. I say, when you're going through this process with a person, imagine that the person sitting across from you 35 years from now, other than being fatter and grayer, maybe less hair, is exactly the same. Can you be happy? If the answer is anything but a resounding yes, take your time. Take your time. We, all, we always get FOMO for relationships, right? The idea is evaluate the partner objectively. Because if you, and, and the reason that, you, because when you start doing this, you're going to feel attraction. And the more attraction you feel, connection you feel, the more leeway you're willing to give. Now, there's another aspect to this, which I usually teach in a different seminar. It was called Defense Against the Dark Arts. It's all about social predators mm -hmm. and how they hack these mechanisms to gain access to your life. I actually have a webinar coming up on uh, Thursday called Defense Against the Dark Arts. And we talk about narcissists, sociopaths, how to profile these people. That's not the purview of this. This is assuming the person in front of you is relatively ethical and honest, right? So you're gonna get into a you're gonna get into a groups of two. Yeah, we only have two, four, six. I should well actually we can do two groups of three. We'll do two groups of three. And what you're gonna do is when you do three magic questions, there's a couple of things you want to do. We're gonna go much deeper into it, but I want to give you a basic template. 
right? So level one questions are location occasion. They're, they're simple, non-threatening questions about why you're there and who you're with, right? So I could say to Eduardo, you know, so I'm curious, what brought you out tonight? <laughs> um, now he's actually going to answer me, <laughs> but that's okay, right? Again, here's the secret to this. You always ask questions that can only that are answered with either an opinion, a story, or an explanation. You never ask a question that's answered yes or no. Now, the questions are simple. They're op they're open ended. They're designed for one simple thing: to get them out of their head and into the world with you. Most human beings are moving through the world in their head, thinking about everything but where they're at and what they're doing. They're checking boxes. They're thinking about what they have to do next, right? That's uh, can't do that right now, honey. Sorry. Anyway, that's the wife. They're in their head checking boxes. That's the worst place to try and influence them in these contexts. We want them out of their head and into the world. So we ask them a simple question that makes them present. Right? So Cynthia, I'm curious, just so I understand you better, what do you like about tonight's lecture? Making you laugh? Cool. And when it make and when it makes you laugh, how does that what does that do for you? Excellent. I love it when people are engaged. I think it's really important because when you feel really engaged, then you get more out of the interaction, right? You intuit more things, right? Look at her. She's like, how did that feel? Okay. Yeah, right? How many times did I say engaged? Right? That was the word she emphasized when she was talking about the laughter. And so I overused it. See how natural and organic but I can just, now again, without, I don't want to make you self-conscious, right? But if I just looked at her and I say, engaged, 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 engaged. Now she, she's on the spot. She knows what I'm doing. And what do you feel every time I say that word? Yeah. Because she likes to laugh because it makes her feel engaged, right? That's the point. There, as, again, when, we're, when I'm teaching the beginners, they don't. most of them lack the, the sensory acuity to hear the words that are emphasized in a string of conversation. So I just make them remember everything. So you don't, there's no guarantee. There's absolutely no way you can miss it, right? But the idea is when I use those words, it forces their nervous system to pay attention. Now, that was level one question. All I wanted to ask was, what did you like? What did you like about what you've learned so far tonight? Right? She's going to give me an explanation, or she's going to tell me a story, or she's going to give me an opinion. All I'm going to do is pay attention. I'm going to acknowledge what she said. In other words, I'm going to validate her response. Thank you so much for, for, for letting me know that you're engaged in what we're doing. So just so I understand you better, when you're really engaged in a process. What 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 happens then? <laughs> yeah, she's, she's, got, she's smiling ear to ear because she's playing a movie in her head. She knows exactly what happens when she gets engaged, right? Right? She can't not do it. Yeah. Great. And what's I'm curious when you say it's good, what do you like? What what makes it so good? See, so all I did, what did I do? I, I asked a question. I listened to her response. I validated her response, whether it's one word or, 20, or 10 sentences. Thank you so much. That's amazing. When you're engaged, when it's good, what's that do for you? I'm curious, right? So I, I, I listen. I, I pay attention. I validate what she says. I find some way to acknowledge and, and, and really reinforce that I, I'm on board with what she says. I echo her words and I ask my next question. And I just wash, rinse, repeat through the entire process. Now, from there, you're going to go to level two questions. Level two questions are always, again, the same idea. Story or questions that can be answered in an opinion, a story, or an explanation. 
we're going to talk about career passions and pleasures. So I'm curious, Cynthia, what do you what do you love to do? Um, I like to sing. Oh, wow, you like to sing? Were you ever like in a professional? Did you do it professionally or more as a hobby? Cool. So I bet there's an origin story. Did you just wake up one day, come out of the room singing, or did you just pretty much? <laughs> <laughs> this one can carry a tune, right? So again, that's level two question, right? See how I, so you just come out of the womb singing, or there's, I bet there's an origin story there. Right away, she started thinking about, without her telling me, she started thinking about how she got into singing. Now, along with that, how she got into singing are all the good feelings that came with it. Guess who she's looking at? Guess who gets linked? Happens automatically. I don't have to tell her to do it. So everything she loves about singing is now here. And the more I echo her word, now she knows she's on the spot, so she's being a little reticent, and that's okay, right? But the, the longer I keep her talking about it, the more those feel, the more intense those feelings get, the more she's going to tell me about her favorite singing experience or the one that really locked it in for her, that this was something that really... And I'm going to ask those kinds of questions. Why? Because it's about her. It's about the things she loves. It's about the things that make her heart sing, no pun intended. Right? That's an engaging conversation. Right? And if I can make her laugh while she's doing it, it's even better. Right? So that's level two question. Career, passion, pleasure. Now, for most human interactions, that's as deep as you ever need to go. But if you're in a, in, a, in a relationship where you want this person to be a bigger part of your life, a business partner, a romantic partner, a, best, a bestie, a bestie, right? Now we can go to level three. Level three are all questions about early positive childhood experiences. Who were your friends? What did you love to do as a kid? What did you play at? Right? We'll... we'll delve deeper into the level three questions after you guys do the practice and I answer our Zoomers questions. I want you to break up into groups of three, A, B, and C. A is going to be the person initiating the, 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 the echo technique and the 3MQ protocol. B is going to be the recipient. So you don't have to do any echoing. You're just Your job is just to sit there and have a great conversation. C is going to be your manager. C is going to make sure that you're following the drill, keeping time. So we're only going to do about five minutes a person to do this. And then A becomes B, B becomes C till everybody's had a chance to go. And then we'll come back, we'll debrief, and then we'll go deeper into um, level three and the do's and don'ts of this. And then I'm, I have lots of other things we can talk about, um, but once you have this, you're, you're cooking. Is that is that useful? Okay. You can go anywhere you want. You can, uh, you can go in this room. You can go in the. I don't think that, I think the other room is locked. So There's probably room down in the bar. And uh, it's not. A All right. Well, so that's fine. Uh, Teresa, can you kind of Teresa, if you're going to hang out, can, they're going to go out and practice in like the little lobby area. Can you just kind of proctor them on three magic questions and echo technique? <laughs> Teresa is one of our experts on this. So Sorry. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So give it about fifteen or twenty minutes, and then. Um, We'll come back. All right, let's go. Let's go to our Zoomers, and um, we'll take it one at a time. Go ahead. I'm going to go back a little bit from the, towards the beginning, and then we'll catch up to where we're at now. Um, let's see here. Well, hopefully, I answered all the three MQ questions. Lots of three MQ questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is going to earlier though. Um, Kenneth asks, David, is it okay for a girl to know your intentions of dating her? Because there is a girl I was interested in, and we had a wonderful time, and when I told her I liked her, she started to act disinterested. Okay, so that can go both ways. One of the problems with, again, some of the things that when it comes to relationships are very counterintuitive. They make a kind of sense when you step into the other gender, the other person's position, but from our position, they're not. A lot of times um, it's the uncertainty of somebody's um, level of interest that generates the attraction. So a lot of times if you put all your cards on the table, which is what the nice guys do, um, it actually kills the attraction. Okay, Because 
if the if the person is uncertain or you're not following the script, they start to wonder why, and that actually generates more interest, if that makes any kind of sense. So uh, if she is being aloof, there's, there's two possibilities you're going to have to test. One is... Um, you scared her off because you got too you got too serious too quick. You got you went from playful to romantic, which sometimes that works. A lot of times it doesn't. The other one is it's a shit test. It's a test to see how you'll respond when she goes cold. Will you chase like a puppy dog, or will you man up and bust her stones and 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 show that you're not needy? You need to test that. You know, but based on my experience, that's that's the two directions or the two things that's possible. Okay, I have to look at her body language and 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 some of the things that she says. Um, it could also be that um, you the way you said it or what you said triggered a memory of a past relationship, and you just got in the way of that process. But you have to test it. Next. All right, so Dem asks, what are some subtle signs a woman gives off when they're not interested in the conversation? And and when I think referring to like also if they might get a little bit um before they get on friendly, like yes. So one of the things you want to look at three basic three basic areas you want to look at first. First and foremost, look at their posture, right? If they're repulsed, depending on where they're feeling that, that hesitancy, that part of the body will start to move away. Sometimes they'll cover an area. So they, if the body language starts to close off, they're not feeling comfort. So I look at the posture. Where, where's the center line of their body pointing? Right? If they're pointing at you, but they're kind of lean back, look at me from the side. So this is interest. This is neutral. This is I need to get away. Right. So this is the ventral line of your body right here. This is where the, all of your organs are. This is the most sensitive area of our body. So where we point this in, in, in relation to another human being dramatically tells us the level of comfort that we have with that person. So when you're talking to somebody, uh, first thing I want to look at is where is their center line pointed? Is it pointed directly at me? Is it pointed off to the side? Is there anything blocking access to that center line area? If there is, I know that I have some degree of guarding going on. Okay. If their hands are up or their their their, their hands are up this way, this is also a warding off gesture even though they're showing you their palms, which many people consider to be a, uh, a sign of attraction, showing the palm for attraction is more this rather than this. So palm showing, depending on, on the position, combined with a, vent, a, a, a postural shift or a ventral orientation, these are all things that can signal lack of comfort. Now, a lot of times they'll be very subtle. A lot of times it'll just be this, right? Or this. Right, they'll they'll find subtle ways, or maybe they'll cross or or blade up. Anything, any any movement that way can signal some level of discomfort. Also, look at their pupils. The more the more interested in you and aroused a person is, the more their pupils will dilate. the The more guarded they are, the more they'll shrink. Okay. So we one particular trait by itself doesn't mean anything. But when you start seeing them showing up in twos and threes, the problem with, with most interactions is guys are so focused on trying to impress the person, they're not paying attention to the subtle body language cues that are happening during the interaction. One of the things we're going to play with towards the end of tonight is what we call the mating dance, which is the five to seven stages of attraction going from stranger to intimacy, where it's time to, to find a place to be more private. Okay, but there's so many. The problem with body language training is that there are so many variations that just memorizing them is a major feat. But if you if you if you distill everything down to heuristics, if the per, if if a person is um, this is another person, if they're facing me directly, if, if there's no obstruction, 
This is somebody who feels comfortable. But the more I, I create blocks or, or barriers to this area, the more uncomfortable or guarded I'm becoming. If the, the pupils are a good, a, a good uh, indicator of how much processing a person is doing. So the more they're thinking and, and filtering their responses, filtering what you're saying, the more their eyelids are going to get slitted, the more uh, pinpoint their pupils are going to be. So those are the things I look for. Hands, feet. If they're looking, if, if from the waist up, they're pointed at you, but from the feet down, they're like this or like this. The feet don't lie. Okay. Uh, most people can lie with their face unless they're dealing with someone who's super trained because we spend more time practicing this. Most of us don't work on our feet. And so our feet will tell us if we're towards or away from. Next. I want to thank you guys for hanging out. I know I was spending a lot of time uh, with my live, my live folks. And the reason is I play favorites. The PDS people drove across town to be here. And, and so I give them as much of my attention as I can. I love you guys, but you're not here. <laughs> and uh, follow-up question there. I don't want the conversation to be episodic, but I want to make her feel wanting more and more. What should I do? Okay. Use the echo technique. Use the three magic questions protocol. Always leave the conversation on a high note. Be the first one to leave the conversation. Don't when you when you exit a conversation when you exit an interaction don't be like a don't be like a dimmer switch where it just fades off and you just kind of I mean just cut it at a high point always leave them wanting more right you've all had this experience you've ever been on the phone with somebody and um, maybe you say something like you know I got to leave in a few minutes and say okay bye and all of a sudden they just they're just gone instantly and it's like almost it's like almost like they suck the air out of your lungs because they, they, they left so fast. That's the energy that, that creates scarcity, that leaves them wanting more. Always leave them on a high note. When they start to hand it's time to go, be the first one to, to end the conversation and end it not like an asshole or not meanly, but end it, start, it suddenly. That creates a kind of, 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 of scarcity impression um, that makes them want to interact more. They'll start wondering, why do you hang up so fast? And they'll be spinning. All right. And it's very difficult to do three MQs when a woman doesn't have much time to talk. Yeah. I do my best to extend the conversation by five to 10 minutes, but she leaves. What in these time constraint scenarios, what should I do? Acknowledge that's a time constraint. Okay. Here's the thing is when you use these, these, these principles on people, they're going to want to spend time. But if you're doing it in a place where they have to be somewhere and do something, one of the worst places you can do this is when they're on their way to the restroom. Hmm. Now you laugh, but people do that, right? You have to think about your environment. You have to think about the context in which you're interacting. If you know that that person has a limited amount of time, acknowledge that, right? Set, set it up through your conversation, through your body language, that it's going to be a short interaction. Deploy as much of the technique as you can and prime them. When's a good time to pick this up? Set a time, set a date. And if they show, pick up where you left off. Be respect. I, I, when I was telling my, my, my attendees here, when you go and you use the echo technique with people, right? especially like on servers and bartenders, you're going to get amazing service. You're probably going to get free stuff. The problem is, is that you could get them in trouble because they want so much to spend time with you that they're ignoring everybody else, right? If you've got a, a waiter or a waitress or, or somebody who's got to be somewhere and it's important to them, you're creating a conflict in them and it's a values conflict, okay? And if you're, and if you're not as high on their value tree, as where they're going, they're going to leave you like, like gangbusters. Okay. So be very aware of your environment. Be very aware of the context. If you know there's a time constraint, work within it and set up a meeting or set up a continuation later. Okay. Celeste says, men often start talking to me when I'm walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long to stand there and talk to them before I go. Not sure if they're planning on asking me out or just being friendly. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So establish for yourself an arbitrary time limit, just a standard time limit. Say someone stops you on the street and say, hey, I'd love to talk. I've got about two minutes. What's, what's on your mind? Now the onus is on them to get to the point. And you're not being rude. You say, hey, I really got to be somewhere. I've got about three minutes. So yeah, what, what can I do for you? Right. Anthony C. says, other than manifestation, how can I generate attraction to try and get someone back? It's been almost two years and they've been on my mind like crazy lately. Hasn't been any contact in about a year. Okay. So the first thing I would do for you is I would clean up all the shit regarding that person and see if you still want them. Because usually what happens when we when, when somebody when we've got somebody we can't get off of our minds, A, it's not about that person, it's about something earlier, and B, 99% of the time it's not because that person left, it's because they chose to leave instead of us choosing to look, to get rid of them. And so a lot of times it's simply we want the opportunity to reject them. I want to prove to you that you made the mistake. I'm going to get you back and then I'm going to own you, right? Now, I don't know if that's true for you or not, but those are the patterns that I see. So first and foremost, go and clean up everything related to that person and everything prior to that relationship that may be driving your boat. See if you still want them. Then go sleep with three or four other people. And if you still want that person after you slept with three or four other people, Eh, maybe it's time to try and get them back. But here's the other thing I want you to think about. If that person left you, there's a reason. Do you know what that reason is? Do you acknowledge that even if you don't think it's true, it's true for that person? And you need to understand how they came to that conclusion and what you need to change in yourself for that to stop being an issue. And can you win back their attention, interest, and desire to go back into another relationship? Okay. Remember, people leave, they leave for their reasons, not yours. And whether you agree with their reason or not, it's their reason. So it's true for them. So the question is, is it true? And if it is, how do you fix it? So they calibrate your different. So there's a lot of different ways you can handle that. Liam asks, um, it's so easy to pick up quotes, women. I don't know how I don't think about it when I talk to women. Maybe that's it. And then probably, that's, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've also had uh, someone asking a whole lot about uh, whether or not the Black Friday deals apply to CPI too. He's asked a few times. So I've now gone into the public chat, and I figure I'll just voice the question. Uh, if it's in the if it's in the uh, if it's in the if it's in the store, yeah. If it's not in the store, then you have to call the office and deal with Moss. All right. There is your <laughs> answer, sir. All right. Um, the thing that occurred to me that I think you pointed at before, but um, didn't mention it ex uh, ex directly when it comes to guarding, like mm -hmm. some people position objects between them at yes. the table, things like that. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the mating dance. Right on. Yeah. All right. Uh, Zoomers and uh, Nigel, who was asking about the... Uh, CPI two says thank you. Hmm? Um, let's see here. Anthony C says, "LOL." David always hits the nail on the head. I was either with her when my mom died, so that could be a big factor in my attachment for sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Um, Damon asks, "What course to buy to go very deep in the state control?" Killer influence, attraction. I would actually killer influence is probably even better than attraction mastery which we're doing live in a few months. Yes, that, uh, we actually have a live event coming up in January. If you want to get the full state control training, come out to come out to the January training. We're like capping it at like 30 people, right? Yeah, this room actually is, is this is, yeah. So when we fill this room, it's done. Yeah, so that's going to be awesome. It's I'd recommend coming in, get in the 22nd of January, leave the 28th. It gives time to uh, come and go, but it's going to be amazing. How much time we got left for them, Richard? Five minutes? Okay. What else you got, guys? Come on. You guys okay. having fun? Are you enjoying the show? I'll wait for some feedback there, but we have another question. Mm -hmm. Best ways to mask the echo technique. Best ways to mask the echo technique, change your tonality, change your speed, change your volume. Turn statements into questions and questions into statements. Um, when they speak a lot, focus on the first thing they said and the last. 
Um, these are all way, again, what, what, what counts with the echo technique is the words. Not, again, if you, this were an NLP class, Richard, you know, Richard's not dead and hopefully he'll be around for a long time. But if Richard or, or, or uh, John Grinder heard me say what I'm about to say, they'd be spinning in their not graves. <laughs> I don't care about their volume. I don't care about their tonality. I don't care about the tempo. I don't care about uh, pitch. I don't care about any of the paralanguage that they're speaking. What I care about is the exact words they use in the order and sequence that they use them. Whether I deliver those words with a question, a command, a statement, or in fragments, it doesn't matter. What matters is they're getting their very own words back. And the more varied ways they get their own words back, the more organic the conversation appears to be. And it is. But you don't but it it, it allows you to not have to be creative and come up with clever things to say. All right. Now we have Hi, doctor. I just want to say that I use the echo technique over a text with a girl whom I saw in public. Mm -hmm. I didn't even use it in person as I was in a rush. In five days, she fell in love with me and we're together for a month. Thank you so much, doctor. You're amazing. You're welcome. You're welcome. And again, you don't have, that's the beautiful thing about the technologies we teach in Planet David. I learned a long time ago that I want to focus on things that are, that work, whether I believe in them or not. Now, if you believe in them, great, but if we can distill things down to a simple set of mechanical processes that we can just deploy and calibrate results, that's going to give us fuel and motivation and feedback that we can use and become more effective, right? The cold behind the, everything in Planet David is transformation and solving the problems that life gives us with powerful, easy, simple to apply solutions that are also fun. So I'm glad when I hear people using the echo technique and getting really good results. Right. I my belief has always been that the more advanced the technology is, the easier it should be to use. That is not how a lot of my my brothers and sisters in the classical traditional NLP and communication worlds tend to think. They tend to think in more complicated, eloquent, articulate terms. Um, and to me, that just that tends to make our languaging more specialized, but not universal. So I'm glad when I hear people using these things and getting getting such good results. It just gets better. The more you play with it, the, the more powerful you become. Got two more questions here. Jax says, David, every time I talk to guys, I go into immediate Chuck. How can I stop this? I don't know what Chuck means. What does Chuck mean? Yeah. You mean a choke? I'm guessing that's what she means. Okay. Chuck, so no. what's happening is, A, you've got some memories from earlier interactions that you're accessing. And so those feelings are infecting your interaction. Just like I talk about the guy who's about to approach somebody who's attractive and they're running all the crappy movies in their head about when they got rejected, same thing's happening with you. So the best thing that you can do is go in, clean up those memories, vent the emotional charges, and rehearse a different way of approaching. Start by controlling your physiology, get your body feelings right, learn a basic template, and just play and, and chunk the pieces of the template down. We'll talk about, we're going to talk about when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, positive eye contact. We're going to talk about the mating dance. Um, and finally, the three magic questions, level three. One of the biggest problems that people have when they're trying to learn these uh, social dynamic skills is they try to do too much too fast. That's the fastest way to learn nothing. In fact, once, you'll hear that over and over and over again when you come to Killer Influence. The fastest way to learn none of it is try to learn all of it. Right. I literally on this computer right here, right now, I have literally six months of training that just get deeper and deeper and deeper. None of you will be able to use it because you haven't mastered the fundamentals yet. Right. So I give things that are fast, effective, lay the foundations. Once you've proven that to yourself, you come back, you add another piece to it. And you just get better and better, better. But as long as it's easy, as long as it's fast, as long as it's fun, you'll do it. And if you do it, you'll get better at it, and then you'll have room for more. It's not about, especially with persuasion and influence, whether it's dating or negotiation or mediation or jury selection or whatever other uh, therapy or whatever application it is, in this particular field, a little bit of information applied well is way better and way more effective than a lot of information not applied at all or applied half-assedly, okay? An echo technique is the skeleton key to the human nervous system. If you really get this, people will open up and you can read them like a book. And if they don't, if you can't read them like a book, they'll read the book to you. A couple more questions. Uh, I'm just going in as best I can, the order they came in. Um, 
I think it's Sigma over uh, YouTube has asked, do extroverted and introverted women share similar signs of being attracted to men? Is there any difference? Uh, extroverted people will be far more talkative, generally speaking. Um, introverts, by their very nature, tend to think more about what they say before they say it. Okay, so their body language may not be as large. One of the things yeah, I do have, to, I, I, I do want to caution you guys about. A lot of us are shy or have some level of of social anxiety. First of all, understand something: social anxiety is actually a human thing. It's not something that makes you broken. Every human being has this stranger approach mechanism that signals a little bit of stress when somebody approaches. That doesn't mean you have a phobia. It means you're human. But the meaning you assign to those feelings will determine the frame you wrap around it, which will determine the behaviors that arise from it. If you have experience a feeling of, of um, arousal, neurological arousal, when someone approaches you, it doesn't mean you're afraid unless you, you decide it means you're afraid. But if you default a sign of, 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 of the word anxiety or fear to that sensation, then those are the memories and the histories that your nervous system accesses and applies to that situation. Remember what I was talking earlier, what else could this be? The moment you experience or sense those sensations and you find yourself wanting to apply a label to it, the moment you ask, what else could this be? You now have the opportunity to rewrite the meaning of those feelings. And because of that, your behaviors, your perceptual filters and everything else will change too. But again, it takes a certain level of awareness. Remember, there's people out there who are naturals at this. Then there's the rest of us, right? We have to train. We have to practice, right? And there's a learning curve. But if you never learn any of it, you never, you can never go through that curve. So come on in. Don't be bashful. It's all right. I'll be uh, curious to find out what this was like for you guys. Did we, did we lose Cynthia? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Sometimes they run screaming. Yeah. Yes. We have a couple more questions that are there. Um, the gentleman who had the success over text says, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Should I leave the conversation on a high note with my girlfriend to maintain attraction? And how often should I do it? It's a good practice, but if you do it every single time, they'll pick it up. So you want to have a broken rhythm. Sometimes you do it, sometimes you don't. Right. This brings up an interesting parallel. One of the questions I used to get asked a lot in, in term in the context of relationships was, you know, when is it appropriate to give somebody a gift? Um, because in, in the old days, the old days, listen to me, um, you know, there was this idea of, you know, being a, a dominant or a, versus a supplicant, you know, are, you know, giving gifts to women is a way of supplicating. It's a way of kind of getting tamed by the woman or whatever. And the, and the question would always come up. Uh, when is it appropriate to give somebody a gift um, or to, to call people on their bullshit or whatever? And the thing I tell people is, why are you giving them the gift? Why are you giving them the gift? Are you giving them the gift because you generally want to give them something because it makes you feel good to give it? Or are you giving it so they'll feel something or do something about you or for you? Mm -hmm. exactly but i guarantee you there's been other times where you're giving a gift because it's their birthday and it's expected right it's a it's a holiday you're you're doing it because it's obligational it's expected of you here's the the paradox of relationships the relationship that's predictable becomes boring the relationship that becomes boring causes the partner to lose respect. When the partner loses respect, it's only a matter of time before they're rocking the Ramada with somebody else. Okay? So the idea is the, the emotional ups and downs, the little flirting and playfulness, all of those things that got you into the relationship in the first place, you need to keep doing those. 20, 30 years, and that spark will still be there. Now you'll still you'll grow together and you'll mellow in certain areas, but it's that up and down, the give and take, right? The problem that we have, and again, we're kind of lapsing into relationship stuff now, but one of the problems that we have is what one of my more infamous mentors used to call pathological trance states. 
you're all programmed with a certain set of identities that go off at certain points in your life. When you meet somebody and you're dating, there's a certain identity. You're the romantic or hero or heroine. You're going on a romantic adventures together. You're doing fun and exciting things. And then as you go through that relationship, now you get into the boyfriend, girlfriend stage or the fiance stage and relationships change, right? Now there's a commitment and now there's all these other things and you're planning a future together. And But it's still fun. It's exciting. It's new. It's the honeymoon period, no pun intended. Then you get married and then you go through the hun- the real honeymoon period, right? The first or two, three years, and then junior comes along. And all of a sudden, new identity role, mother, new identity role, provider, father, right? And then soccer mom, PTA mom, career mom, this mom, that mom. By the time you're down here, you've got 27 different identities. And the one you've never, you've locked in a little box and kept away was the romantic heroine, the one wanting the adventures, the one wanting to lasso the moon and pull it down. You know, you ever watched uh, that uh, Jimmy Stewart movie, Jimmy Stork, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I'm going to pull down the moon for you. No, I don't. Yes. I was just thinking about. It's on. Um, my last almost boyfriend. <laughs> almost boyfriend. <laughs> He, he saw me every day and he gave me presents every day. That's great. 18 roses, cowboy boots. And I just ran with it and I didn't worry about why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just happy. Yeah. So is, is that okay? We can just. Yeah, it's fine. If someone's going to give you gifts and they're going to give you a lot of gifts, you might want to start thinking about what's the agenda. Right. Oh. The other thing you want to think about, and this is something that a lot of people don't really think about unless their relationship's in trouble. But if you think about the things I'm about to talk about before you interact, it makes mate selection or partner selection a lot easier. What is your attachment style? What is your attachment style? What is your love language? Guess who you're going to be most compatible with? Person with the same love language, same attachment style. An attachment style is the way you relate to people in inner in relationships. In other words, some like if we talk about love languages, some people perceive love through acts of service. Some people perceive loves through words of love. Right? Attachment styles are people who are either very needy or if you try to connect with them, they run away. They're avoidant. Right? So there's like four or five different attachment styles. Yes. So Go ahead. Attachment styles, the, the basic ones, you're going to see uh, anxious attachment, which tends to be like very, to be needy or clingy. There's a, a, they get nervous and so they kind of hang on tighter, mm-hmm. right? You have avoidant, which tend to, as soon as there's any discomfort, like I'd rather throw a grenade and avoid getting hurt. Like I, if I don't let you get close enough that I get attached, then I'm protecting myself, which, and again, these things are really unconscious for people, mm-hmm. right? Um, you have, a disorgan- disorganized attachment where they go back and forth between both of those. And then you have secure attachment where it's kind of like Man, there's a book I'll put on the I'll put on the on the show on the notes for this. It's all about attachment styles. And the reason I bring this up is because knowing your checklist, knowing your values is important. Knowing how those values are satisfied is really important. But people are always projecting. If you're someone who's clingy and needy and you're in a relationship with someone who has an avoidant style, you're going to be chasing them all over the fucking house and they're going to be running for cover. And you're going to be perceiving rejection and this person is going to be like, right? And they don't, because the way they're interpreting what you're doing is different from your intended communication. Right? So these are things people don't think about until they're in a relationship that's in trouble. If your checklist matches, we'll talk about those. If your attachment style matches, if your love language matches, and you have at least five or seven things that you actually like that are in common, you got a pretty good shot. You got a really good, and if your credit ratings match, you're golden. You laugh. In some of my research, the longest, most successful relationships had people with the same credit ratings. And political affiliations. Yeah, it's weird shit that you wouldn't think has a correlation. But if you think about it, a person's credit rating is a sign of their dependability. 
their trustworthiness, the consistency. Isn't that what we want in a relationship? <laughs> Check in the boxes, baby. Right? You notice how so much of what we're doing is about profiling the other person? But you see, we the profiling doesn't help us if we don't know what to compare it with, which is you. How well do you know you? And if your answer to that question is, I'll know it when I see it, oh, wrong. As so many people in Soulmate Secrets discovered, right? Because there's questions, there's like, we, we have a whole like lists of questions to elicit very, very deep levels of checklists in terms of your life values and everything else. So now you know it, now you can recognize it. And it's like, holy shit, Batman. Now you weren't there for this, but in the last coaching session, uh, that I taught. I have a weekly coaching program. I actually did a, uh, something called the life mission questionnaire. And it's basically four questions and then a, a mission statement for your life. And one of the guys was a, a ex medical doctor who's working in biotech. And when he answered those questions, he realized that everything about his life was wrong. <laughs> and that was, I mean, he, couldn't, he couldn't figure out why he was always miserable. Till he did that list and realized, oh my God, everything I want is not there, right? He wanted to make a difference. He wanted to heal people. He wanted to tell stories. He wanted to, and he was working in biotech where he was constantly being attacked, constantly having to defend himself, constantly have, it was just people always trying to out ego each other. It just, it just wasn't. And the moment he saw that, you could just see the, the relief flooded. Because again, we're, we're, we're taught and we're brainwashed into what we should want. And we pursue it. And when we get it, it makes us miserable because it's not who we are. It's not what we want, but it's what we're supposed to want. No, what do you want? Is this going to be another very long moss-like question? Okay. So uh, just in listening to you put all this together, it, it occurs to me to mention a couple of things. And also one of the questions is really relevant to where you're at okay. right now. Um, so... One of the things that we specialize in here is self-transformation. So there's a conversation of maybe doing a self-mastery supercharger, which mm -hmm. we're dealing with a lot of these like attachment style issues, core traumas, core traumas are usually issues around rejection or abandonment or betrayal, things like that, which mm -hmm. affect how we relate to the world until we clear it up. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe doing the soulmate secrets also, which is connected with those classes. Questions. Um, I have to keep them on track. Yes. Thank you. Very enthusiastic about this all. Um, how do I know if it's time to break up with somebody? My girlfriend and I love each other, but occasionally the thought that pops up is maybe I should, and I don't know why. What's your values? Um, the question continues. I don't want to. Was I, I don't want to. Buy, I don't want to, but I'm worried my other than conscious mind is trying to tell me something. Probably is. Right. What are your values? What are your boundaries? Is this person satisfying them or violating them? It's a very simple question once you know what makes you happy. And when you express what makes you happy, does the person give you what you need the way you need it? If the answer isn't more than 80% of the time, you should probably consider your options. Okay, let's get back to debriefing our folks. What did you think of the 3MQ process? Was it cool? Was it easy? Good. Good. <laughs> it was good. I want to throw that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, it's good. We can practice and you can improve. Uh, when you were the, the C person managing, how hard was it to get them to shut up? <laughs> you couldn't get you couldn't get each other out of the conversations, could you? They kept going, right? That's the point, right? But I also use the top to let them know that they're doing it right. Yes, perfect. So you, you realize how they keep spewing is because you're connected. Yeah, that's the that's the thing. It take this this particular process takes so much heat off you to be a great conversationalist. If you just echo their words and even do a a, a kindergarten level free magic questions, they will come away from that interaction thinking you are the most fascinating conversationalist they've ever met because they got to talk about their favorite subject. Out. Yes. Go ahead. So grab a mic. Here, I'll use this one. 
So after you do this process and the person's like so enthralled and they're all into talking about themselves, how do you get it back into a two-way conversation? Well, that's, that's a great, great question. So one of the, how many of you noticed when you were doing your little 3MQ process that when the minute the person you asked the questions to started talking, little bubbles started popping in your head of similar experiences that you had. That's called, in, in my world, first of all, that's a natural, normal part of a conversation between two humans. I gave it a fancy label. I call it analog matching. Now, in the untrained individual, this happens on dates. You're sitting there telling your story. This person's sitting there pretending to listen. Because what are they really doing? You said something, it sparked a memory, and they're waiting for you to shut up so they can tell their story. You've heard people parroting this. You've probably done it a few times, right? That's going to happen. That's how humans connect, by sharing stories. How do you hack that, though? It's really, really simple. When a person is telling a story and it sparks an analog in you, shut the fuck up. Let them speak. When it's your turn to speak, tell your story shorter, but use their words to tell your story. That cements the experience inside. Okay? The fact that you use their words to tell your story means that it's going to match their internal experience. It's going to trigger all the same feelings. And even though they might be already primed to see the similarities, now they can't not. They can't not process the similarities. And then you boomerang them. You ask them another question that gets them talking again. So you say, I was like, yeah, I went to this, I went with my friend to this, uh, we went to Fiji this one time. And while we were there, we realized that we wound up, we, we didn't know where we were going. And all of a sudden we wound up on this topless beach. And I'm, you know, I think I'm pretty liberal. And then I see all these topless people walking around or sometimes bottomless because they were a little bit more liberal than me. And I'm like, Ooh. and inside your head, you're going, fuck, how do I match that? You know, right. But, or, but you know what? I understand that. I'm once, you know, one time I was, when I was living in Oklahoma, my friend said, Hey, I got this party. I was, I, there's this party I want us to go to. And I was like, okay. And I walk in and I realize it's a swingers party. And I'm like, oh. the next thing I know, my, my, my girlfriend's, my, my friend's girlfriend has got his, her tongue down some other guy's throat and then clothes are flying out. I'm like, oh. right. So I don't know if I got all the words, but, Right. I thought I was pretty liberal, but I found out I wasn't that liberal. Right. So, so has that, have you ever had anything like weird like that happen to you? Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. And now this is how it works. So the secret to this is it's okay to speak. It's okay to tell stories. Just be brief. Now, in lieu of being too brief, the more descriptive you become, the more compelling you become as well. But the best words that you can use are theirs. And you just boomerang, you just ask another question and you're back to the same process. And you guys can, you can the, the, the protocol was designed to be is to take you from stranger to intimacy in as little as 20 minutes. Do you, do you have to do it in 20 minutes? No, you can take hours. You can take days if you want. You can spend days at this. You can do this with people you've known 50 years, which would be hard for me because that make me seven. Right. But, but the point is, is that it doesn't matter what stage of relationship you're at. People don't change. Technology changes. How people use their technology changes. But the, the programs that run that, that keep us operating, interacting, they don't change. So this stuff is going to be relevant for centuries. Right. Until we start implanting cybernetic organisms in our head and shit. Like, oh, God, no. Right. So the idea here is location, occasion. Early positive, uh, no, I'm sorry, um, career passions and pleasures, analog matching, use their words to tell your stories, ask another question, just wash, rinse, repeat. Now, as they start telling you things about their careers, their career aspirations, everyone you meet is going to have an idea for a book or a business. Now, why is this, why is career questions so powerful? It's because in your neurology, you have beliefs and those beliefs come in a hierarchy. 
You guys having fun? Okay. Um, normally I would give you guys a break, but we've only got like a half an hour before I have to end it. So uh, if it's okay with you, I want to give you guys a gift if I can. Normally to come to see me, to work with me, to I've, I've, I've spent over 15 years um, in private practice dealing with physiological illness that's caused by repressed emotion. So I dealt with everything. There's one of my patients now. <laughs> um, remind me to put it on do not disturb going forward. Uh, these are how we learn. Um, the, normally to walk in my door, it's $375 just for the consultation. Now my, my actual going rates are like three grand. So, but I do have a protege, someone who, who works very, very closely with clients and things like that. He's sitting at the back of the room. His name is Moss, right? He's a very, very skilled therapist working under my close supervision. So I'd like to give you guys a gift. For those of you who have stuff you want to clear up, for those of you who would like coaching or um, troubleshooting or advanced one-on-one tra -on -one training and communication, we're gonna, I'd like to offer each and every one of you a free 30-minute consultation with Moss. And uh, yeah, he'll sit down with you and you can pick his brain, discuss things you want to be able to accomplish, things you want to clear, you know, and it's all on the table. If you just want to pick his brain for 30 minutes, it's his brain, I can rent it out, um, right? Um, he'll answer those questions. If you have things you actually want to work on, uh, he'll help you with that. So we offer all of our prospective clients a free 30-minute consultation. This is my gift to you to determine if your case is an actual fit for our methods, right? After you pass the screening, and that screening can be, again, picking his brain, or we have certain processes we do to make sure that this is actually a good fit for you. Will can discuss strategies and tactic tactics for getting those situations resolved in the shortest amount of time possible. So if we can help you, we will. If we don't, if we can't, we'll tell you that too. And we'll point you in the direction of people who we think would actually be a better fit for you. There's no charge for any of the consultations. It's just free to see Moss and he'll get you scheduled. Um, and again, if you just want to ask questions for those 30 minutes, if you have actual things you want to work on, uh, I've seen Moss deal with some pretty heinous stuff. Right? I've, I've thrown him in the shit pretty much from the day he walked in to train with me. So there's only a handful of people that I actually uh, trust to work with my clients. And if there's something that comes up that Moss is saying is that's a David job, guess who you get to work with? Right. So again, it's free um, if you're interested. Just go see Moss, you know, at the end of class or whatever. Um, okay, that's done. Now, what was I talking about before I got interrupted? Oh, career, passion, pleasure. Your belief systems have a hierarchy. At the top of the pyramid is what we call spiritual beliefs. So these are these are beliefs about your mission in this life, who you are. Right below that is your identity. Right below that are your values, the checklist. That's it. So you go, it goes from environment to capabilities to behaviors to um, deservingness, I think is one of them, and then values, um, identity. You know. The reason that uh, questions regarding or, or stories about career are so powerful is because in most countries, in most cultures, you are what you do. In other words, if I ask, uh, if someone were to ask me, David, what do you do for a living? I'd say, I'm a neurolinguistic programmer. I am a Qigong master. I am a hypnotherapist. I am, I am, I am, right? That Those two words keep coming up in everything. Well, anytime you hear anything pre uh, preceded by the I am phrase, what you're hearing is an identity statement which means that if I'm an accountant, then at the apex of that pyramid, right below spiritual mission, are the highest, most powerful beliefs that I have. So when people start talking about their ideas for a career or a book or a business or what they do for a living, they're communicating with you from an identity level. Those phrases and that content has the most power just short of spiritual transformation they can't resist those beliefs. They don't want to because it's them, right? And when they start talking about their career or their passions, they're gonna, they're, they can talk to you in terms of possibilities or limitations. 
So if you ask somebody, so you're an accountant, wow, man, I, I've, I've never been really good with numbers. So I always wondered how people fall in love. Did you just come out of the womb and say, numbers are my jam? Is there an origin story there? What's behind that? And they might say something like, well, you know, I've always just had a knack for numbers. My mom and my dad were both accountants. We used to play word games all the time. It was just something we all bonded over. I just love numbers. It's just very clean. It's very easy. And, and you know, I can see when I, you know, when I finish college and I get, I'm going to get my own firm and I'm going to have all that. Now, what do you know about this person right away? Besides the fact that they're good with numbers. Do they see life through the sense of possibility and deservingness or entitlement? Ah, contrast that with, well, my mom and dad are accountants. I got, I'm pretty decent with numbers and just seem like the natural things that when mom and dad retire, I'll inherit the business and I'll just keep it going. And, you know, I don't like the way they do a lot of things now, but, you know, uh, once it's mine, I'll take it over. I'll move out of the basement and get out of rehab and, and, and things will be great. Right now, here's what's funny. You laugh because of the, the obvious dissimilarity. They will be just as happy telling you the second story as they will the first one. You know why? Because you've made them feel validated and safe to talk to you. So they, they're they getting deeper into attraction, connection, rapport. You're going, fuck no. Right? Do you do, 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 do the fuck no face? No. You say, oh, that's very interesting, right? Again, be respectful because you've made these people vulnerable. Right? You've created an attraction in them. Even though you're checking them off, they've opened themselves up. And the other beautiful part about this particular process is because of that enhanced level of rapport, that deep level of connection and openness, it becomes increasingly harder to make shit up. It's harder and harder and harder for that person to actually lie to you without actively breaking rapport and signaling it. You'll literally say, if they, if they try to lie, you'll, you'll literally see them go, you'll, you'll feel it snap. Right. This is this is so powerful that my friend Chase Hughes, who's like the leading expert in be in mind control and, and interrogation, actually uses this in interrogation when he interrogates people because it it just it just harder and harder for them to not tell the truth because they want to because they they feel heard they feel safe. Yeah. A sociopath's a little bit different, but. There's other tells you have to look for with a sociopath, but hopefully you've, you've screened them a little bit before you've gotten into that. But here's the thing. Uh, if you take the time to profile them, actually, when you come to Defense Against the Dark Arts, I'll show you ways to do that. There's a whole system called FLAGS, Focus Lifestyle Association Groups. You can do a whole kinds of homework before you get to them. Uh, in Defense Against the Dark Arts, which was the number one NLP training program of 2022 and 2023, it's all about how to find these people and deal with them. Um, there's like 21 different red flags that come up in conversations that they use. It's, it's, it's really in depth, but you have to decide you want to go there. Cause that's a, even though it's a cool course, it's a little heavy, <laughs> right? So I have, I try to make it light, but it's, you're dealing with some heavy duty topics. Okay. So let's talk about level three questions. You never go to level three questions unless you're, this person has checked enough boxes that you feel safe having them to be an intimate part of your life. If you go to level three questions and, and you haven't done this homework, you may wind up with a stalker. If this person is even remotely borderline, you're going to have problems. Now, level three is early positive childhood experiences. You're still using the master echo sequence, which is ask your question, validate echo, ask again. Okay. Uh, we didn't talk about softeners because right now there's too many things to juggle already. We'll talk about softeners at, at the next training. Why do we want to use early positive childhood experiences? One of the things you'll learn as you get deeper into the concept of hypnosis and therapy and things like that is that the earlier the memory, the more foundational to a person's identity and belief systems you get. The most powerful memories that you have happen between zero and five. 99.99 times out of 100, when I regress somebody to deal with a trauma, it's zero to five. Even though the, the, the thing they, they're trying to fix happened when they were 33, you go, go back to the very first scene, situation, or event that is the source, the beginning, the root of that problem, they're five years old. They're four years old. They're in the womb, right? And something's happening, and that was the hook. 
in this context, how many of you have ever met somebody and even though you just lay eyes on them for the first time, it's like you just instantly know this person. Like all of a sudden, even though you've only been talking for 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's like you've known this person your entire life and everything just bonds from there. You know this person is going to be a very important person going forward because it feels like they've always been there. When you ask about early positive childhood experiences, it causes people to leapfrog back to that memory. They open that file and play the movie. With that comes the sense of time, the positive feelings, and the mindset of the child. Who are they looking at when those things open up? Who are they looking at? Who are they facing? They should be facing you, right? Guess who gets linked to that passage of time, those positive feelings, and everything else? Now, all of a sudden, within the space of a conversation, it's like, man, I feel like I've known this person my whole life. Because you inserted yourself into the memory. Can you see? Ah, it is. Right? That's why you don't use it. Unless you know that this is the right thing to do. Because you will, you will, karma's a bitch. I know I dated your sister. Mercy and hope, right? <laughs> For most things, you don't need to do this. But if you know this is the person and you want to give it a, a, a shot, remember, you're not taking away their free will. They can walk away anytime. But you are giving them the feelings that you want them to have about you, right? So you have to decide where your line is in the sand. I can't, I can't make that for you, right? But this is going to take the randomness out of your selection. That's why what you do in the first two stages is so vitally important. Because if you choose the wrong, if you if you fudge it, now you've got someone. I had a I had a one of my my mentors in the martial arts was he was the biggest dog I'd ever met. Oh my god! This if it had a pulse, he would chase it. And he asked me about some of this stuff, and I said, look. I'll teach this to you, but you've got to be really, really sure that that's the person you want. Because I got this, I can handle it. He got into this relationship and man, every time I saw him, he was miserable because he didn't check the boxes. He went right for the level three and he was, he hooked himself because again, there's a mindset. Remember I said that, that this contraction is a two way street. And if you're not ma managing that, it's going to manage you. So not only did he hook himself to someone who was just not good for him, right? She was hooked on him. So it was this avoidant attachment, clingy. It was, it was, it was ugly. Uh, very carefully, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, why, what, what is now? One of the things we want to be gauging through this entire process is: Are they actually following the instructions we give them? Like, if you ask them, I'm curious: Where did you grow up? Who were your friends? What did you love to play at? What did you love to do? And they start talking about how Uncle Ted used to take him out back behind the barn and show him a special kind of wrestling. Or they start talking about how they were abused as a child or how they were bounced from foster home to foster home. What should that tell you? Change the conversation? Are you checking the boxes or not? Right? Because if they're willing to divulge those things at that level, you were destined to become their therapist. Their baggage was destined to become your baggage. You see, even at level three, we're still testing. How many of you have ever been in a relationship? You thought they were great. You thought they were healthy. Six months in, you find out they're a fucking basket case. You're welcome. Because their baggage will become your baggage. Wouldn't it be better to find that out after 20 to 30 minutes than six months? Right? If they start volunteering this stuff, 
after 20, 30 minute conversation, what do you think your relationship is going to be like? You understand? This is about getting very strategic, very systematic, and say, is this a fit or not? There's a fit for everybody. There's someone for everybody. But if you keep fudging what you deserve because you think there won't be something better, there won't be something else, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing that person that you're attracting a disservice because there's a better fit for them too, right? So yes, is it manipulative? Hell yes. But is it deceitful? No. Because why are you doing it? Are you doing it to hook somebody that's not a good fit for you? That you're not going to be a, a good partner for? That's manipulative. That's deceptive. Are you doing it to find out what's this person going to be like six months from now? So you can make a decision. If they, if they have a lot of trauma, you don't have to write them off. You just keep them as a friend. It's so instead of saying, you know, you, you, you can start to develop all of these different levels, right? You can have an intimate partner, a life mate. You can have a friend with benefits. You can have a bestie. You can have an, an inner circle of friends. You can have, ex, you know, extended friends. You can have acquaintances. You can have the, you know, people you're neutral about. You can have hell knows. You can slot them anywhere you want, right? I draw the line at deception. I draw the line at removing people's choice. Like, for example, there's one system out there that specializes in what we call confusion induction. You walk up to somebody, you slam them with a confusion statement, and then hammer them with all kinds of suggestions so you get free coffees and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, it's, it works. works really well. Some of you are like, ooh, I just found my next gift card for Starbucks. Anyway, um, but is that a win-win? Yeah, you, know, you got your free coffee, but you just got them fired, right? To me, that's 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 not cool, right? When I'm doing this, I'm doing this for a very strategic reason. Yes, I want to generate attraction, I want to generate connection, but I want to know about this person so that I'm not making a bad decision and I'm not being doing something bad for them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, there it is. I didn't want the attachment. And that's perfectly fine. You don't have to agree to an attachment. You don't have to, just because somebody likes you doesn't mean you have to do the full Monty, right? But a lot of us work that way. We're so desperate to be approved and validated that we think that because someone likes us, we have to like them back in that way. Guys, especially are very, very prone to this. Ladies have a little, they're constantly getting approached anyway. Guys, it's a little bit more of a scarcity thing. I'm just telling you the way it is, at least from my work perspective. Right. Um, questions about that? Yes. So then, how do you get to that third level question where you balance? Because you don't want to get hooked with somebody who. What happened during the first two levels? Did they match your checklist? Okay. Then take your time, ask them about early positive childhood experiences. What do they tell you? What do they say to you? Let's see. The what kind of relationship do you want exactly they may be great people but because of their damage because of their baggage your relationship will start out romantic and become therapeutic. Better to find that out right at the beginning and manage it than have it hit you and blindside you. And a lot of us have been in that situation, not once, <laughs> but multiple times because we're on our best behavior at the initial stages of the relationship. And as we progress, and we become comfortable, we feel safer, and we become identified with the relationship, the demons come out. And we think we're the we think because this person's demons are all like directed at us that we're the problem. It's not actually you. 99% of the stuff that's being dumped on you is about other people that you just reminded them of. It's not personal, but 
most people don't understand that, right? So a lot of times it's like, as you work on yourself and you develop these skills, here's the cool, and here's the good part of the not so good part. You're gonna, if you actually take the time to invest in these skills and practice them, you will have the skills to attract pretty much anyone you want, any time you want, or just about any reason that you want. The suck part is, is you'll be saying no to most of them. Why? Because they just don't check enough boxes. And that's okay. Because now you've taken the randomness out of your relationships. You've gained more freedom and choice and the ability to make better choices. And you don't need to use it for just dating. Go for a job interview. Negotiation, mediation, therapy. It's all the same, right? I have, I literally had a, a personal injury attorney, one of my good students, um, um, what the heck's his name now? <laughs> I, I'm coming off like eight days of intense training and like I have like less than 12 hours or eight hours sleep. So, um, but uh, Chris Stombau, he inherited this case from a couple of his colleagues They'd been working on this case for like three years. And in like 30 minutes, they got more information. He got more information out of a client who had brain damage than those other three people had in, th in three years. And I've seen that happen over and over and over again because of the way these techniques affect the nervous system. Yes. Good question. Mm -hmm. yes, it's, um... Microphone. Yeah, let's get a microphone. The ladies have them again. They do. They get to our page from your playbook, Moss. We used to tease Moss all the time because no matter where the microphone started, they would always end up in front of Moss. A quick question is: um, what, Tell me what you think of this technique. Is that um, you dating this uh, successful mm -hmm. lady that was um, dermatologist mm -hmm. and? And she was very pleasant, very cheerful. And I said, you know what? It just feels a little bit too cheerful, a little bit too toxic friendly, positivity. A little bit too cheerful, too friendly, a little bit too mm -hmm. something. I think she's hiding something mm -hmm. underneath the personality. Yes. So I just threw out a question that I wanted to see the response. And it, it was going to go either good or bad. Mm -hmm. And it, it exposed how she really feels. And I said, there it is. So mm -hmm. I'm glad I found out now and not yes. months or years later. Absolutely. And it, it just happened to be, you know, she's a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. So I just asked her about one little skin condition and she blew up. And I said, that's, you know, that's what I, I knew was hiding underneath. There. Yes. Follow your guts. You know, that's one of the, you know, uh, what Sifu Johnson likes to say, I've never heard anybody say, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't follow my gut. Right. Um, Usually your, your autonomic nervous system, that more primitive primal part of your brain is a little bit more tapped into unconscious tells. Unfortunately, the problem with unconscious tells is that they're unconscious. And so if we're consciously focused on something else, we usually miss it. So we need to, we need to sync them up a little bit. And that's what this does. So let me give you a couple more things before I send you off into the, into the ozone. You guys, is this useful? Has this been helpful? Right. If you guys like this stuff, I invite you to check out our website, nlppower.com. You can, Moss can give you the website and stuff. We have trainings coming up. I don't create meetups to, to fill trainings. I created meetups because I was bored and like to do cool stuff. And I wanted to meet cool people who like to do cool stuff. Yeah, there you go. See? So one of the things I want to, want to talk about is called the mating dance. And I want to talk about what I call positive eye contact. When we start looking at behavioral cues, one of the things that we, we want to look for is what we call deviation from the baseline and clusters. So baseline is what's their norm? What are they normally like? Okay, yes. Depends, it really depends. The more time you can spend observing them, the better a baseline you can develop. Well, again, if I'm if I'm observing somebody from a distance, I'm going to look at how they're interacting right now. 
and I'm going to make that their baseline. Oh, so you do make like somewhat concrete decisions? Like yeah, because if I'm observing something I'm about to approach, I need to know where they're at right then, right there. So as they deviate from it, right? Okay. So what is their norm? And then what we look for are what we call clusters. Clusters are data points, two or more. So for example, I, I showed you a cluster earlier uh, in regards to um, during the question that some of the Zoomers asked about when somebody's feeling uncomfortable. This, the area between your eyes down the center of your body is what we call your constructive center. This is where all your organs are. All of your organs lie in that space. This is by definition, the most vulnerable part of your body. It's the place we're always primarily predisposed to protect. So if I'm talking to Eduardo, right? And he makes me feel uncomfortable. Now I actually did two things here. I changed the orientation, but I put an arm between my baseline or my center line and him. That's a cluster, right? That would be something. So this is my norm. All of a sudden I said something like, oh, let me think. Now it's a third one. I touched my, I touched my face, right? Again, we could spend days. In fact, my, 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 my colleague Chase created a whole behavioral table of the elements, which if you try to interpret that thing, your eyes will cross, right? I'm more of a heuristics guy, rules of thumb. Like when I showed you, right? That's a continuum. Exactly. <laughs> you can look at anybody's behavior, anybody's posture once you have that continuum and extrapolate where they're at. You don't need to know 67 variations. That's how I think. So clusters. One body language cluster that we want to master is called the positive eye contact cluster. Now that's my term for it. So there's three aspects to the positive eye contact cluster. A, eye contact, a smile, eyebrow flash. Okay, now we talk about the eye contact part. That's a genuine smile. You see the little wrinkles up here, right? When, the, when you have those little muscles crinkling up here, that's a legitimate smile, right? If you look at somebody smiling and they're dead from the nose up, that's not, that's a social smile. So as you're moving through the world, you want to make eye contact, smile, flash your eyebrows. See, he does the whole head, right? You must be from the East Coast. <laughs> How do I know that? Because I grew up in Pennsylvania and I used to spend a lot of time on the Jersey Shore. And every now and then you'd be walking down the, down the boardwalk and you see guys, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Instead of doing this, then hey, how you, the whole head goes, right? That's an East Coast thing, right? But the idea is the reason we, we focus in on, on the eyebrow flash is called a key stimulus. When mammals approach each other, if they want a single signal friend, it happens in a millisecond. Yes, every human being does it. Every mammal does it. Right down to little babies. Yeah, they'll tell you, right down to little babies, okay? So when you approach and you genuinely, you, you make eye contact and, you'll, and you'll, you'll, you'll just give them a flash. If you see the flash, immediately return it and you'll see them visibly relax. Your eyebrows are one of the most powerful body language signalers that we have, okay? Positive eye contact, legitimate smile, legitimate eye contact, eyebrow flash. That's a three that's a three cluster set. When you move through the world, look him in the eye, smile, and flash him. See, she's look at her. She got all googly. All right. All right. I look at hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey, how you doing? I look at she just gave it back, right? You see, you can't not do it, right? How you doing? <laughs> oh. Avoid it. Avoid it if you can. It actually, it actually is a barrier to to connecting with people because you can't you can't use that part of your body, right? And it can actually affect your liver. Are they is the person with the Botox also like barrier between their body? Yes. Body by their yeah. Body? A lot of times it, it'll actually blunt your emotional affect, so it's harder to feel. That's a Chinese medicine thing, but because this is a liver part of your body, so when you when you poison this area. Yeah. I don't know whoever thought it was a good idea to inject toxin, neurotoxins into your skin. I get the cosmetic thing, but you know, it's just, it just goes to show you how our values are. You know, it's, and again, 
I'm not really one to judge um, because we are who we are and we'll never make the world what we want it to be until we're ready to deal with it the way it is. Right? I, I, I gave up my idealism a long time ago. The universe is trying to bring it back, but I'm still way too much of a pragmatist, right? We're here to learn how to do something so we can get something, so we can have something and, and build on that, right? Um, so the positive eye contact, I, I want you to guys play with that. And, and really, if you, if, you, if you take nothing away from the class, and I've given you guys a lot of stuff, if, you, if, you get, if all you've got is echo technique and the positive eye contact with the eyebrow flash, that's gold. And then you evolve to the 3MQ, people are just going to love you. Right. And then work on getting yourself out of those situations when it gets a little too strong. Right. Um, like I said, there's lots of other things that, that we could talk about, signaling approachability, stuff like that. But I wanted you to have that positive eye contact. And the last thing I'm going to leave you with is what we call the mating dance. Mating dance, when human beings approach, let me see if I can find this really quickly. And you guys, you guys can, are welcome to take screenshots or whatever. Oh, I, I I absolutely do have the I do have it there, um, but I wrote it down just so I could. Yep, seven stages of dating, meeting, and relating. So the, when when human beings meet for the first time, remember that eyebrow flash I told you about. Um, can I use you? Would you like to would you like to be the hot the hot ingenue in my movie? Okay. So here's uh you can sit here. All right. So we'll pretend that this is a bar stool. And I'm gonna make my approach. Okay. So I bow <laughs> now did you see the look? She's 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 angled this way, right? And as I approach, she's like right? That's called the acknowledgement stage. She's in her own little world. She's facing the bar. She's her vent. Where's her ventral orientation? Is it at me? It's this way, right? She is in her own little world and I'm not part of it. But as I approach, she, there it is. She senses me on the periphery of her bubble. She, she's got a very big one. It's out here, right? She senses that. And she acknowledges my presence. Now, she just gave me an eyebrow flash. Now I can approach. All right? So now I can be, hi, how you doing? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So the, so the first thing is um, she's acknowledged my presence. Now, what did she just do? She just pivoted. That's called the pivot stage. He did it automatically. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Does that mean she's attracted? No. Oh, nay, nay. <laughs> but she is interested. She's curious. She's wondering what the hell I'm going to do. So you have the acknowledgement stage, the pivot stage. She's given me a little bit. Her, her, her ventral orientation has moved a little bit towards me. The next will be the reaching stage. As we get deeper into the conversation, we don't have a table, but if you go to, if you go to my YouTube channel, um, type in mating dance and a whole video will come up where you, you'll literally see me walking through this same demo with a table and stuff. What will happen is at some point during the conversation, she will reach for her drink. She'll go to shift her purse or whatever. And when she goes to put it down, she will move it closer to me. What about your wallet? That's, that's coming. That's, right? So what will happen is she, she goes to take a drink. When she sets it down, she'll tend to set it down closer to my drink. If she's interested. Oh, yeah. Yes. Because why? Because it's a measurement of comfort. She's not attracted. She hasn't entered what we would calibrate as attraction yet. But we're moving. We're, she's moving into rapport. Okay. Mm -hmm. At some point, at some point, we're talking, we're joking, we're doing whatever. I make a joke and she just like touches me on the arm or she just do something like that. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. And I do the exact same thing. That's the touching stage. That's the sign of growing attraction. Now, does that mean if she touches my arm, I go for the boob? No. That's where people screw up. 
right? They think, oh, I got touch. It means it's okay. No. <laughs> oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. Here's the rule of thumb. Don't get too excited. <laughs> but human, remember I talked about mimicry? Remember I talked about echo technique? What's the right thing to do to her? Whatever she does to me. She touched me on the arm. Where did I touch her? On the arm. I touched her in the exact same place, in the exact same way. I signaled, I'm just like you. So you felt comfortable, didn't you? I can't go and wait to go to a bar. <laughs> well, you, it doesn't have to be a bar. <laughs> yeah, me either. I don't go either. I used to coach people all the time. They'd say, David, I need to work on my club game. I say, first of all, why are you coming to me? Second of all, do you like clubs? No, I hate them, but I, I got to get better at it. Do you go to clubs? No, but that's, that's why I got to get better. Why are you trying to get better at something you hate? Do you, do you like the women who go to clubs? No, but they're hot. <laughs> you see the running west looking for a sunrise, okay. right? The more you know who you are and what makes you happy, the more you know where to look. It's all about you. And when you want to make it about you, you make it about the other person. And then it does become about the both of you. It's kind of a weird paradox, right? So the touch stage is where you actually have the beginnings of genuine attraction. But the touch is a test and a signal. It's saying, okay, I'm comfortable enough with you to touch you. I like you. What are you going to do? Are you going to take that touch and do nothing? In which case she starts to wonder if you have any guts, right? Because that's a it's part of it, right? You got to man up or woman up or whatever it is that you're you're doing. Or are you going to go for something beyond what she's offered you? It's a test. Now, the more you match the cues, the more the barriers to because you're checking boxes. It's just another checklist. The faster you check those boxes, the deeper into comfort and intimacy and arousal she goes. So once you get past the touching stage, you have what we call the snuggle space. Now, I did not make this name up. It's something I got from the study. But what happens is this is one of the few points during this entire mating dance. In 80% of the stages, the woman's leading. Literally, guys, all you have to do is not do something egregiously stupid like vomit on your shoes. Or you know, make an overtly sexual comment. But if you're doing three MQ, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna flow right through these stages. It'll just happen, but you won't be conscious of it a lot of times. Did you ever see those old movies from the '50s where the guy's taking a girl to the movies? And they're either in the drive-in or they're in the movie theater, and the guy's like, he wants to put his arm around the girl, but he's this is uh, right. <laughs> You've seen that, right? Right. What's interesting is that's actually a part, that's a valid part of the actual process that men and women or couples go through. At some point during this interaction, stage four is called the snuggle space. I have to create a safe space. So in, in the wild, there's this particular species of bird. The male spends the entire summer building the ultimate crib, right? It's like putting in a jacuzzi and master bedroom and you know when the when the nest is finally ready he sends out a call and a female bird hops up well what you got here let me take a look oh <laughs> nice bath jacuzzi bidet yeah not too bad i think i'll move in right but the bird likes the nest she moves in and nature takes its course in the mating dance stage four, this is where you have to be the man. You have to be the assertive one. You have to take the chance. You have to create a space for her to fill. So you create it. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. You feel the need to just, right? Exactly. If you've done the, the previous three stages and she's built that comfort, you followed the cues. When you create that space, she'll just move into it. If she doesn't, you got more work to do. It's not a rejection. It just means she's not there yet. 
You understand? From here, you go to the last two stages, which is what we call uh, minor synchronization and major synchronization. In minor synchronization, we start to get more ventral orientation. We'll start to lean in more. We'll start to close her, ourselves off from the rest of the, uh, the venue. You'll see this all the time. People start off, they're out here. By the end of the night, they're off in a little corner somewhere and they're just, just in their own little pocket dimension, right? And what will happen is we'll start to get more ventrally oriented. So her, her center line will line up with mine. We won't, we won't do that here. But if I take a drink, she'll take a drink. She moves her napkin, I'll move my napkin. We'll start literally doing what each other's doing. As we get deeper and deeper into rapport and connection, we'll go to full synchronization. This is where hand-holding, kissing, all that other stuff will start to happen. There's a... <laughs> do that? <laughs> Thank you. If you what? only knew. <laughs> um, what's interesting is, and this is where you would literally change venues, you know what I mean? Right. So those are the, that's the mating dance, right? And believe it or not, if you if you actually are paying attention to the cues, you can go through this also in as little as twenty minutes. Well, again, who's who's doing it, right? The like, depends with who. Like, there's a challenge, <laughs> but I used to teach this, and I I, uh, I don't know if I have that video available on YouTube. I think it's in one of my products. I I had a a, a class that was like seventy percent women that was going through this, and one of the ladies in the back stands up and goes, "This is the best chick flick I've seen in weeks." They were rooting for the woman. <laughs> now, if you ever get to see that video, what you'll see, and I hesitate to point it out here. Remember I said the body-mind feedback loop? For every psycho-emotional state, there's a body language position that triggers it. Your physiology controls your psychology. Even though she knows it's a demo, have you noticed how she just goes into the next stage automatically? You know why? He's actually going through the physical stages of attraction. She's actually feeling playful and attractive. <laughs> yeah. Did you see how she was playing with the microphone? That's what they do with drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't normally point that out in a in a, a public show. I, when I when I teach like killer influence, or I'm teaching the the actual courses, and I'm showing the or attraction map, and I'm showing these videos, I actually show you the the hidden side of what's going on. It's a feedback loop. It literally can't not happen, right? But you don't need to worry about that. You guys have enough to play with just with the, the, the three magic questions, uh, the echo technique, the state control. The state control is critical. So much of this happens automatically if you can just get your feelings under control. And that's posture and breathing. Okay? And then the, I want to do, do a workshop later on on just how to be funny. Right? How to tell jokes and how to... Right? Um, because there's a structure to humor. Right? Some of us can do it in... For fun? For fun, yes. <laughs> fun has a structure. Are you a Virgo? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Give her a big round of applause. Thank you. Excellent. So that's the mating dance, right? And again, I, it was the, the abbreviated version, but here's your assignment. Go out and watch humans in their natural habitat. Go to every diner, every cocktail bar or whatever, and chill. watch people coming in, especially ones on first dates. When I first started teaching this, one of my students, her name was Tammy. She actually owned a wine bar. And when I was talking about the, the reaching stages and stuff like that, she went, oh, my God, you're absolutely right. I, when, I, when I open the bar, people come in at the beginning of the night and they're on opposite sides of the bar. By the end of the night, their wine glasses are touching. They're all over. They're in each other's laps, right? It's in front of you all the time. Now, here's what's cool. With the exception of maybe the snuggle space, and even that, 
a lot of these stages happen in meetings and negotiations too. You'll see people who are on opposite sides of the table and as they move towards agreement, they start getting closer. If they can't get, they'll start angling in the same direction. They'll start mirroring each other's movements as they move closer and closer to agreement. Or a lot of times you'll see you'll see reciprocal, like one person before another person can be doing this. <laughs> they'll be in sync. In the rapport exercises that we teach in Killer Influence, like we literally have what we call rapport wars. Where like I have to have a conversation with you, but I have to constantly mismatch your body language while I'm doing it. And it's high comedy for me to watch because the conversation just goes to shit in seconds. Like they have to maintain an actual cohesion conversation while constantly mismatching each other. They can't do it. Then we set it up where they have to actually argue and not give an inch while matching and mirroring each other's body language. And they can't do that. Like they start moving towards compromise. The body plays such a tremendously powerful role in verbal interactions, but it's completely transparent. But if you understand it and are willing to play with it and practice it, you can do all of these invisible things and just guide the entire interaction in the direction you want. And you never have to lie, cheat, steal, or misrepresent. You're just taking advantage of naturally occurring forces that are going to happen anyway. But if you don't take control of them, they happen by random and by default, which means sometimes it works for you and sometimes it doesn't. Well, most of you didn't come here to get more randomness in your life. True or not true? You only came here to get the randomness out. Yes? These are the, these are the palettes or the paints on your palette. Pick the ones you like, overlearn them, make them unstoppable, come back, learn more. Thank you all for coming. See Moss. Thank you all on Zoom. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you had a good time, please post positive things to the meetup. If you didn't, post to somebody else's meetup. We'll see you next time. Take care.